Hello again, everybody, and welcome to a thrill-packed edition of the Jim Cornette Experience. We're going to make millions happy today, folks. The build for Celebrity Mania continues. Who will be the guest wrestlers? Also, Jericho's a heel, Tully's fired, the Hardys reunite against the Job Squad, and more as we cover the week in Unremarkable Wrestling. And to join me, Hawaiian Brian, the podcasting lion, the king of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network, Mr. Co-host to you, He's made his mark as a remarkable mark, the great Brian Last, everybody. Aloha, Jim. A pleasure to be here once again. The remarkable mark. I like that. I got to copyright that before Jericho gets it. Trademark it. That's right. DM. Well, it's another day. You got nice weather up there, don't you, in New Jersey? Beautiful for this time of year. It's about 57 and just very, very sunny. No clouds. Yeah, we'll just sit back and wait. By the way, it is 56 now here, as I see on my computer in Louisville, Kentucky. That means it's warmer in New Jersey than it is in Louisville, but it's 66 today. We're going to get three inches of snow tonight and zero degree wind chill in the morning. Have you know, every time I give the weather report, the people around the, the globe, the people, in, in other parts of the world besides the United States, must think that I'm ribbit. Every day I come on here, well, I was 70 yesterday, and now it snowed. There's an ice storm coming tomorrow, then it's going to be a record heat wave, and it's going to rain three inches at the same time. This is all what's been going on. I just want some leaves on the trees. If I don't know whether I've told you this or not, Brian, but I'm a very depressed individual in the wintertime. No. Because there's no leaves on the trees. Everything's so brown and gray. All the leaves are brown and the sky is gray. I went for a walk and froze my ass off because it was Ooh. too cold. Now I'm depressed. Yeah. See, you can imagine that. See, <laughs> the mamas and the papas, they, they did that song and all their lives went to hell. Papa Jim Cornette. That's right. Just call me Papa Jim, baby. <laughs> um... <laughs> But I I hate it because the end, and of course, the only evergreen tree, I'm trying to cure that this year. I've called a couple of uh, landscapers to plant some more evergreens, and I've been hearing that apparently they're just too busy to just do anything. I had one guy come out here in October. He said, well, I can draw you up a plan, but I couldn't even do the mulch beds till next spring. Thanks. Then I never heard from him again. Nobody wants money. But anyway... The only evergreen I got in my front yard is, of course, my treasured stalk. Now that the tornado winds in December mutilated and blew over, I want some leaves. I want the dogwoods in bloom. I want the red buds in bloom. I want the the birds twinkling and the the little chipmunks and the rabbits running around and the sing about the moon and the June and the spring instead of this cold, <laughs> drab, dreary, dry. Bleh, we've had going on. And the property was invaded. The, we had an invasion from the local fire brigade the other night. Brian, you should have seen this. The fire brigade? The fi I'm, I'm down the road from the fire department. So at least if something happens there, they're close. But you get used to hearing out in our little suburban area, I never used to hear a siren. Now we hear the, suburb the, the, the sirens, right? So you kind of get used to anything. Well, something's going on somewhere. Well, the other night, it was about to get dark, and I'd gone out to take the garbage out, and I smelled some smoke. But uh, these people that had bought the property a couple doors over to the right from me, they uh, all last year, they were cleaning brush out of the far end of the property, and they were making burn piles and burning all of it, it so much they didn't want to haul it off. And I've seen those people over there. I'm thinking, well, they're burning something again this early in the year. I go back on in the house. It gets dark. And we start hearing sirens in the distance. Well, that's not unusual. But then they seem to get loud, and then they kind of stop. And then Stace looks out the front window. And all of a sudden, I look out, and I see it, too, the reflection of red lights. And she said, there's something going on. And we look out, and on our little street here, there's four or five full-size fire engines with all the lights, red lights going. And there's a fire engine, a fire department truck, not a fire engine, in the neighbor's driveway over here to the right of me. And the lights are going and traffic is 
traffic is three cars coming that way is stopped because they don't know what's going on. And I look in the backyard of the neighbor and the, there's somebody in the neighbor's backyard with a flashlight shining it around. I'm like, are they looking for some goddamn escaped murderer? Right. And Stace got Harley in her arms. I said, don't come back here. And I start walking back to the, toward the back where the guy can at least hear, because I figure it gets the guy with the flashlight cannot be the escaped convict right? Especially with all these trucks around, he would be probably trying to make less of a fucking presentation of himself. I figure this is one of the good guys. <laughs> so I go back there for well, right? I agree. I agree. But then as I go back there, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. He don't know I live here because I'm just some fucking muck now fucking walking around in the goddamn backyards. I, I, as I get to where he could hear me, I, hello, can I help you to make sure that he knows that I'm not trying to hide? And I said, uh, is there something I need to know? And a, the guy yells back, no, apparently somebody called in a fire, a report of a fire, because they, all this, and you sp still smelling the smoke. And they've the fire department has been going all around this area. They can't find the fucking fire. They can smell the smoke. They can't find what's burning. He's shining a flashlight back into the corner of my property. I said, there's a creek down there. I don't think it's on fire. And they're going up and, and over to the subdivision across the way. And, and so the fire department is like the Keystone Cops. Every vehicle they have within a 10-mile radius is out here trying to look for a fucking fire that they can smell, but they can't find. Gave me a lot of confidence in case anything happens. That was your invasion? That was invaded. They were all around me. I was surrounded. Almost had to get out the slingshot. Start picking them off as they came up. I'll sit on the turret at the top of the castle. And Have you ever been invaded by the fire department? Oh, you were going to storm the fire brigade? No, they were storming me. I was minding my own business. I don't storm anybody. I just... Put up the fucking drawbridge and you just stand on the hill and boil yell at a everyone. couple of yeah, <laughs> I, I boil a couple of big pots of oil and stand up there and yell. Are you the one yelling? You goddamn right I am. Come up here and get a fucking hot oil massage, motherfucker. But I'll tell you what else is hot, Brian, and shows no signs of cooling down, and that is the hot action figure sale right now at jimcornette.com. The feather bottoms are exceeding all expectations. And we're getting so much feedback. People are getting, if you order a t-shirt, bing, 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 you're almost wearing it by the time you hit send on the order. They're amazing. And I've been doing my part, hand signing, autographing all the behind the curtain graphic novels, the Cult of Cornette membership certificates, the DVDs, the autographed pictures, and getting them right, and they're shipping them right out. But the action figures, the last remaining copies of the Christmas variant, the red and green, I think we're down to about, uh, we're almost down to about the last hundred. So this has been a great response. Get in while you still can, because we're, we might buy, what is today? Well, it doesn't matter that I'm going to hear it this day anyway. By the time you hear this, it'll be the weekend. And if you wait till the next time we do the experience, you may be left out, is all I'm going to say. So get at jimcornet.com, click on the collectibles, get those hot action. Maybe that's where they, they smelled the hotness, the heat of the action figure sale, Brian, and somebody called the law and they sent every fire engine they could to, I'm so hot. I'm the hottest guy in wrestling. They're calling the fire department on me. What's causing all this? Any ideas? <laughs> Action figure sales. <laughs> I believe is the answer. All right. We've got, a, here's another issue we got to bring up real quick. Uh, we've talked about this before, and there was a piece a few weeks ago on PWInsider.com written by Mike Johnson, a responsible, reputable journalist and, and reporter. The documentary that the WWE folks did about Vladimir, the super fan from, from uh, up in the Northeast. He, you know, everybody knows Vladimir that's been 
to a WWE or WWF big show over the last, what, 30 years? How I'd, I'd love to know exactly how long it's been, but I can't see the documentary because they won't release it. We've talked about this, that they did the documentary on this guy who's probably their most over the years, longest running, most devoted fan. I can't tell you the tens and maybe the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he spent on big show tickets and plane flights and lodging and merchandise and to go to every one of these pay-per-views and these big events and they did a documentary on him and how what what the WWE and wrestling has meant to him and his life and involvement and they teased it it was at some uh film festival or something around about last WrestleMania time that they showed it in public just once and everybody raved over it and couldn't wait to for it to be released. And then they got mixed up with the Peacock thing. Maybe it was two years ago at WrestleMania, whatever. They've had it on the shelf for a while. And they stopped all the documentaries when they started courting the cock. And then they... They've changed their strategy where now they're going to the A&E documentaries and series and they put up more of the new material on the cock, but the old stuff gets the heave-ho. But I don't know why that they wouldn't show this thing when they've gone to this much trouble, not only to put it together, but to highlight a great fan's devotion to their product. Most fans hate the WWE enough as it is, personally, viscerally, because of they hate the evil empire, they fire all their favorite wrestlers, they demean their other favorites that they don't fire, they have bad shows, boring shows, they go to Saudi Arabia and, you know, take the blood money. They've got one opportunity here to babyface themselves to the fans. Hey, we love people like you. We make documentaries about people like you. We're all family here. Now, now, then, back and forth, us together, whatever their tag is, in and out. <clears throat> I know who's doing most of the in and who's doing most of the out. Couldn't they babyface themselves by putting something like this out and spotlighting one of their most devoted fans? Wouldn't you think that would be a, a public relations thing at this point, if nothing else? Or they, do they think that if they do acquire Cody, that that's the panacea? Look that one up, kids. Uh, for all of their ills, what do you think, Brian? I mean, no one knows what's going on here, but it doesn't make much sense. Why wouldn't they release it, or at least comment about why it's not being released? What the hell happened? Is WWE the filmmakers of that documentary? I don't know if you would know this, or if Mike Johnson had this in the article. But the people who made that film, are they still aligned with WWE? Are they the WWE film crew? Well, yeah, it, it was done, you know, in-house. It wasn't like a separate production company. And even if they got, they didn't just, it, it, they didn't wholesale fire or slaughter the entire department. And even if they did, if a piece of work is finished, it's not like that uh, those fired employees, technicians, producers, whatever are, you know, are standing in the way of it, or it's not like they don't want to release. But that was my the question. WWE wouldn't want to release a piece of work that somebody did that was there. A lot of people worked on that. Well, that was They'd my question. They had to stand them up against a garage wall and shoot them all. That was my question about if it was in house or not, because one of the possible yeah. things would be a fight with a director that could definitely no. cause something to disappear. But if this isn't that, and if it's not, I mean, there would. Peacock, they're with A&E, A&E's doing documentaries. We don't know if it's tied into that, but it predates the A&E deal, I think. Yes. Well, and besides that, this this wouldn't really be something that I don't know. Maybe they would, that A&E would be interested in because it's not a big name biography of a celebrity, but it's a heartwarming, taint-tickling, you know, look at a guy who loves their company and always has and has supported them for all of his adult life or whatever. So I don't know, but they're missing a PR opportunity. It might not be a ratings grabber, but they did a lot of these things for the network that primarily appeals to wrestling fans. So if this was advertised on television as a 
out of context, just a thing. It might not trip everybody's trigger that wanted to watch, you know, reruns of fucking Big Bang Theory or whatever. But on a wrestling centric channel coming from a wrestling centric company, this is a program that I think a lot of the fans would want to see more than just another wrestling program because it's actually something about somebody that's one of them. And it's already produced. Yeah. They just have to stick that VHS tape in the player and hit play. That's all they got to do, Brian. I'd want to see it. And I think even if you're not a wrestling fan nowadays, if you're someone who watched MSG shows in the early 90s, you know who that is right away. You may not know his name, but you know his image right away. Yeah. I actually think you would get some people who wouldn't normally watch a wrestling documentary that would check that out. And I'm just puzzled why they're not releasing that. I guess there's there's also the Lex Luger documentary too, right? We were talking about that before it got released and then they never released it. That's right. It, and it didn't even escape either. Uh, so they've got a Luger thing standing by. And, and that that might very well be, well, but I guess A&E might want to do their own shit because they probably have a little bit bigger budget than stuff that was shot for the network. But uh, when, when I found out his name was Vladimir, you, I, I, when I hear Vladimir, I expect to see like Volter. Like a, some Prussian army general or something. But, you know, but his name is Vladimir. Remember that name. We want Vladimir. Free Vladimir. Free Vladimir. Attica. Attica. <laughs> Speaking of Attica and freeing people, how was that transition? I don't know. I got to see where you're going. <laughs> well, we got a murderer <laughs> update, folks. Um, and no, the, the cult came through again because we were talking what last week about the whole deal with Cain Velasquez. And now it's come out that it was the, the news was trying to protect the family because of the nature of the offense and et cetera. But somebody, one of the, one of the fighters, one of the MMA fighters on a podcast or an interview spilled the beans. It was Cain Velasquez's four-year-old son that this fucking guy did whatever he did with at, at the daycare center that led to Cain Velasquez, as we mentioned, the only the problem we had with what he did was lack of proper pre-planning. We said they couldn't get him on premeditation because this was not thought through well at all, and he got the wrong guy. And Brian, you said, by the way, before we do the update, you said last week, and I, I agree with you in this, in a vacuum, well, there's no jury in the world that'll convict him because of the circumstances. But then a problem is after we heard all of the the details, the 11 mile high speed car chase in public and shooting randomly with other vehicles and bystanders around may mitigate the any desire on any of the juries to let him off scot-free because you know yeah that was not a good thing no he didn't do a good thing but he was emotional a guy who is considered calm was emotional and crazed and upon hearing that a family member was molested by this creep and he went out there to shoot him and you know again I, i think a good attorney will argue his mental state, there are plenty of people that talk about what kind of guy he is up there. He will oh, get yeah. punished for something. Look, he shot a guy who didn't do it. There'll probably be something for that, but... Well, I, I think that's the but that's attempted the biggest, murder biggest of the child molester. The, yeah, I don't know. The, the public, you know, in, <laughs> endangering and or involving and or et cetera, other people, not even necessarily the father, but just general people around the public, that may be a hurdle that they have to cross over. But anyway, we had asked and free cane, by the way, we're already seeing free cane signs on wrestling shows, but we asked the question, okay, we obviously you you come up with OJ Simpson and then you come up with Chris Benoit. And then we were saying who are other, not just indiscriminate people that, you know, you might know that had a name at some, but high level celebrity sports figures of you know that have been accused of or guilty of of murder and you know we we came up with a couple of people but the the 
The listeners came in again. Do you remember Oscar Pistorius? After the fact, I remembered it, but I didn't yes. remember. I don't think too much about South African runners uh, until well, but up. but no, it was it was a big it was a big news story though at the time because he had no feet, right? So you know, there's there's a twist on the old story. Uh, I always used to think it was Pretorius. I was thinking of the Ernest Thysiger character in Bride of Frankenstein, but it's Pistorius. But we got Oscar Pistorius. Mark that one down for those of you keeping track on the murderer board. And I remember this name, but obviously I'm not a fan of some of these major sports, but Ray Carruth apparently is a piece of shit who killed his wife and apparently baby. What did he, was he a football player? Football player, and I agree, a piece of shit. And a true piece of shit in the pantheon of immortal pieces of shit. But we have that that update there. Is there anybody else that we've thought of in retrospect? Nanjo Singh, by the way, apparently was the the old-time wrestler that I was thinking of. Somebody tweeted that up, up in uh, Ontario that killed his wife later at, in, in he was very old at the time, I think. Vern Gagne. Well, but see, but now he was never accused of murder. It wasn't murder. It was dementia among 90-year-old men in a nursing home. So that really doesn't. It was demented murder. He murdered him. Oh, come on now. We're not going to. He didn't know what was going on. I, you heard that story, right? That apparently, because the guy that Vern... What did he do? He suplexed him or fucking hip tossed him or whatever. But the guy that thought Vern, he was at the marigold. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> home. The guy that Vern killed was even farther off gone than Vern was and was older, was 90 something years old. And apparently the, the, the guy was, he was in Alzheimer's or whatever to where he would just sit around and make loud, sudden noises. Uh, you know, at random, and he did that one day next to Vern, and it, it sh shocked something in Vern's mind, and he went back to the old days and fucking took the guy down, and, and so that's not, you know, in any way, there was no intent, they didn't even know what was going on. All right, so we'll take Vern off the list. Take Vern off the list. Sorry, Vern. Vern can be, can be on plenty of lists, but oh, what about, you know, we did hear from some people, um, the British wrestler Jim Brakes. Yes, and he was older also. He was like 80, wasn't he, when he killed his wife? And I guess that's been adjudicated. We, we're not maligning him. It's not even alleged anymore, right? This is something that happened. I actually don't remember the details. I thought it was something else, and I'm completely wrong. Then I thought it was something that happened years earlier they only found out about after the fact, but you may be completely right, and I'm thinking of someone else. Well, you might want to Google that just so we don't give any false information out. We can come back later on in the program. Oh, here we go. Uh, oh, well, it, boy, you're a quick Googler. You got the fastest fingers in Jersey, pal. Former ITV wrestling star Jim Crybaby Breaks, 83, who punched his British ex-girlfriend to death on Gran Canaria, is ruled unfit to stand trial due to dementia. Yeah. Jim Breaks was accused of fatally punching ex-girlfriend. The former wrestling star was facing a potential 15-year prison sentence. Donna Crowley, 47, died in hospital after being abandoned following the attack. Brakes is believed to be suffering from senile dementia, according to reports. This means he cannot stand trial and has been moved to a psychiatric hospital. This from the Daily Mail, 2020. How does an 83-year-old dementia patient... Get a 47-year-old girlfriend. S. Riff Flair, I don't know. Hey! Hey! Wait a minute, hold on here! <laughs> Nevertheless. Is that what it is? Oh, is it that? It's that's more a... likely that than a helicopter, <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah, you never do anything unless it's cold and calculating. All right, we got a couple of emails from the listeners. I will change my tone for this one because it's from uh, it's from Mason, and Mason doesn't mention I don't think in this where he is from, but he'll he'll know. And I'm going to paraphrase this because it's really personal. But Mason's father passed away on March 3rd. It was sudden. It was a heart attack. 
He was 66 years old, and Mason wrote us an email talking about this situation and, and you know, listening to the show to help take his mind off things. And uh, it, it was especially, it, this is kind of like a double whammy because Mason mentioned that his father had cancer and had just beaten it and was cleared and announced that he was cancer-free like two weeks prior to the heart attack. And then, so when sudden shit happens, yeah, at least, uh, you know, like, how can this be? But this is kind of even worse because they had, they did the worrying and the stress and it came out okay. And just when they think they can breathe, then all of a sudden without any warning, so that's a double whammy. So Mesa, your your email got to me a little bit. And I the only thing I can say is that he he mentioned he's Mason's 26 years old, so his dad was 40 when he was born and he thought you know, he said optimistically he'd have him for another 20 years and and he says now that was optimistic and being a little foolish, but you had him for 26 years and you know, at that, if, when people have kids later in life, sometimes it doesn't work out at the other end, but you get to appreciate the time you did have. So anyway, all of the point I'm making is, Mason, we appreciate what you, and also I'm going to bring this up at the end, because Mason has coined a term for us, Brian. I'll read this one statement verbatim. I appreciate all the content and work everyone does in the gym pyre for helping keep me sufficiently distracted from this horrible Twilight Zone episode that I'm living in. I like that. From now on, we don't have an empire here. We've got a gym pyre. What do you think? I don't know. If you like oh, is it, that because it's not a Brian pyre? I don't think Brian pyre sounds good. I wouldn't approve of that. No, it doesn't. That's why you weren't involved in it. But gym pyre sounds just great. I'll use it. Lots of pyre. Nope. You'll be left out. All right. What a gym power we have here. Anyway, Mason, thank you, and, and we're sorry for your loss there. But I have another. Maybe a, this email will make you feel a little better, Brian. Maybe you'll like this one a little better. Highly unlikely, but let's see what happens. I just picked this one completely at random. I just, you know, clicked on an email and said, I'll just read whatever one I click on. It just happened to be this one. Dear guys, my single favorite personality involved in wrestling is Jim Cornette. In any discussion about wrestling, nine times out of ten, or even 95 times out of a hundred, Jim Cornette will mostly be right. I can listen to him and the great Brian Last, Mr. Co-host to me, discuss wrestling all day long and have multiple times over, and it takes me back to my happy place like I was watching wrestling and talking trash with my friends years ago. The Jim Cornette experience and Corny's drive through should be considered mandatory listening for anyone that wants to know about wrestling. I can see it now. A young wrestler just joining wrestling school sets foot in a ring, and on a permanent 24-7 rotation, the JCE directly in their fucking ears telling them all the basics they need to know about wrestling and how they should be thinking about it. Anyway... I just wanted to say out loud, I hope Castle Cornette has plenty of good burgoo and hot browns and Sprite Zeros. Last Manor has plenty of good French toast and plain cheese pizza. <laughs> and Harley Quinn has plenty of good belly rubs and treats to snack on. Great job, guys. Your devoted listener, Mr. H.F. Bottom from Sellersburg, Indiana. H.F. Bottom? A devoted listener, <laughs> obviously totally unsolicited email there, a proclamation, testimonial. We've never heard of this person before. Just a fine young man. Mr. H.F. Bottom, that is, to us. Okay. <laughs> All right. Are you ready now? We've got, again, Brian, so many of our listeners... And the, the cult of Cornette to people out there, they're so talented. The songs on the drive through and the the uh the the reports that they send us in on all these shows on not only stuff that we've been talking about, but also they pick up on some of these things, they take them a step further. We've had the why is my controversy raging on when you type in the Google machine 
why is my and the answers that come up the top eight on the board and we've had guys say why is my penis and then you know we've had other and then then the 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 female side came in and asked why are my boobs we had that and this has become really popular with everybody but you brian hello oh yeah i was agreeing with you silently Yes, yes. Everybody but you just loves this segment. Maybe well, now, a, well, maybe not everyone. Well, everybody with a sense of humor. And also it keeps us from having to talk about the wrestling. But now we're going to flip this whole thing. We're going to turn it up on its head. You think just having a female was switching it up? You think just just changing the words from why is my boob to why is my penis? Whatever. No, we're going to change this whole thing up now. A double swizz itch. Because we're changing the gender and the wording. This is from a female fan. We have more than one. And, Brian, as you know, another way of asking why is my or why did my, at least if you're down below the Mason-Dixon line, I, I, at least, is how come? Like, how come you pu puked on my foot? Right? You've asked that a bunch. How come you puked on my foot? I've never asked that question ever, no. Well, you've asked how come you stuck your finger in my ass. I've never asked that you know, one either, but, no. Well, but how come is another way of saying why did or why is, right? We've we've got that part. So, I got this email from Cheryl in Norfolk, Virginia. Hi, Jim. Yes, there is more than one female cult member, me. I listened to both shows every week and watched you in action throughout the 80s at the Norfolk Scope. And she has submitted for our approval her how come my list. But she went one step further. Brian, are you ready for this? No. Oh, my God. That's right. I can't, right, ladies I can't and believe you held that in until right now. No, you had that sound effect. <laughs> That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Right now, we have the latest installment in How Come My Vagina. How Come My Vagina. The top eight answers. Are you ready, Brian? Number one. How Come My Vagina is Itchy? Well, now that's a question you'd want to ask. If anything on your person is itchy, you'd want to know the the reasoning behind it, right? The causal effects of saying. You can agree with that, can't you, Brian? I guess so. It seems like a standard problem that people have. The first thing is usually, why is my blank itchy? And I guess if your vagina is itchy, just scratch it. Well, you got to scratch that itch. But I know you've never asked this question before because you're from above the Mason-Dixon line. You would ask, why is my vagina itchy? Number two, how come my vagina is smelly? <laughs> so now, and these are questions that are, it's, it's, it, they give you auto returns because so many people ask these questions. They type them in the Google machine and it's predictive text, right? Because they hear this so much, this question being typed in. And I guess if you're itchy, eventually you might also get smelly. And there may be some cities where... That may be the number one most searched thing I'm going to guess. <laughs> Homa, Louisiana. <laughs> we'll come in on highly on that one. <laughs> number three. Now you've got itchy and you got smelly. Here's a, a departure. How come my vagina is always wet? I don't know, but I'll tell you what, anybody that has that issue, if you'll send me your... Street address, phone number. Okay, okay. <laughs> and anytime you'll you'll be at home, I would be happy to delve deeper into that situation, come to some understanding of it. But now, but number four, now see there there's problems all across the board. You know, whether you're you know, you've 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 got the the wetness and the itchiness and the smelliness, but number four, how come my vagina is very dry? Oh, wow, the other side of the coin altogether. The other side of the coin. Either you're watching a lot of AEW wrestling, <laughs> or 
or else wise, uh, you just have, you know, it, it's something you, you don't want really wet and where you can fall in and, and not be able to climb out like a pit of quicksand. And you don't really want very dry where you'll scrape the skin off yourself. You know, you want, you want the porridge just right. So I can see where these things would be of concern. Yeah, I understand this is what women want. Jim Cornette to give vagina advice. Well, you know, anybody that can help and and, and lend a hand here. <laughs> if you want to <laughs> lend a, a hand to the Well, and maybe this might predicate number five. How come my vagina makes farting noises? <laughs> now, this is something you need. And occasionally, every once in a while, you hear, let me help. Let me help. But otherwise, it's it's just an occasional, occasional, like, you know. Number six. <laughs> I got to be honest with you, this one is a double header here. It'll hit you coming and going. How come my vagina is burning and irritated? Well, I think the answer to that question would come from one through five, because if I was itchy, smelly, always wet, very dry, and making farting noises, I'd probably definitely be irritated and possibly be burning. Or maybe the answer is she slept with Terry Taylor. Hey! Well, no, wait a minute. You're, 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 you're predicting number seven. Oh. Number seven has a little roosterish tendencies to it. How come my vagina has discharge. <laughs> I, I, maybe she's been sleeping with Terry Taylor. <laughs> see, now you should have waited. It would have been, would have been the perfect one to land right there. I don't know about the, every girl I know, her vagina has discharged. That charge, it costs a fortune to get laid these days. Everything's a la carte, you know. Terrible. <laughs> you, the add-on menu especially at the the house of boom uh can get expensive and uh finally no are you well you know boom you know how are you uh how are you fixed for number eight brian are you ready for number eight i'm as ready as i'm gonna be i'm fixed oh you're fixed i'm well, fixed you've been itchy you've been smelly you've been always wet you've been very dry you've made farting <laughs> noises been burning and irritated and had discharge but finally, you want to know, you got to know these things. How come my vagina is sore after sex? The answer is because you're doing it right. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Cheryl, thank you for that submission. Yeah, thank you, Cheryl. Thank you a lot. All righty then. But you know what? You will not... <laughs> I guarantee you, folks, you will never have to Google the phrase, how come I'm not sleeping well? That is something you're never going to have to put into your, your computing tating machine because we know that you're on the beam. You're on the beam and you're not going to fall off that beam because with beam, you sleep better then if you're off the beam, did you know, Brian, that poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, lower productivity? And I mentioned just recently, apparently that's what's the matter with me for the past 40 years. I've never slept properly, been in the wrestling business, binge sleeping, sleep deprivation, all hours, never regular. And now... Since I've been sleeping properly for the past two years, I've never felt better. I'm in the best health of my life. I'm 60 years old. I don't look a day over 58 and three quarters. And the reason for that is because my lovely and talented wife keeps a big supply of the Beam Dream Powder along with that beautiful glass uh, cup and all the mixing implements right next to the kitchen counter there. When I go in the kitchen, all I have to do is get me a nice cup of cocoa, and I'm off to dreamland. Folks, you don't have to sit there and just eat white fudge-covered Oreos until you fall into a sugar coma like I used to. Now, you can use the Beam Dream Powder. The Beam is the world's most innovative, functional wellness brand 
with products for everything from sleep to recovery. And we can get you a discount on this dream powder. It's the best-selling healthy hot cocoa, which contains natural sleep-promoting premium ingredients, triple lab tested. They tested them in three different labs until they got the results they wanted. There's no THC in this stuff, but you should drink it anyway. And you wake up refreshed. 98% of people surveyed fall asleep faster when taking Beam Dream. 99% of people experience better sleep quality. And the other 2 and 1% were currently incarcerated in federal institutions and not available to speak to our representatives. That's not But you accurate. just mix. it. Well, it, it is, they, they, some of them were in county jails, is what you're saying. No, there's no part of this survey that incorporates the prison population, no. Well, they need sleep as bad as anybody else. Sleep reform? Some of them need more of it. Except they all need to sleep with their backs to the wall. Anyway, just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk. Stir and enjoy 30 minutes before bedtime. I like the milk better, gotta be honest with you. Uh, but you can find out why Forbes and the New York Times and everybody in between are talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes. And right now, for a limited time only, you can get $20 off when you go to Beam, B-E-A-M, BeamOrganics.com. BeamOrganics.com slash J-C-E. Use the code J-C-E at checkout. If you don't love it when you get it, there's another one of these, these saps, these these suckers beam that are giving you your money back just because you don't have good taste. Don't call them that. They're a fine, reputable company that want to take they care should of their customers. Never give, they should never give money back on this fine product that'll put you in a medically induced coma quicker than propofol. No, no, it won't. It won't put you in anything resembling a coma. It'll put you, you in a very nice sleep that you will wake up be, from comfortably the next day. Yes, Not like be propofol. Floating on clouds as long as Dr. Conrad Murray's not involved. If you've got Conrad Murray staying in your house as a, as a house guest, it, I wouldn't drink anything. But, <laughs> folks, they'll give you your money back if you don't like this stuff. And if you don't like it, you got bad taste. That means they're the nice people and you're the heels for asking for the money back. But nevertheless, you're not going to ask for it anyway because you're going to love this stuff because you're going to sleep until your eyeballs pop out. For a limited time, get $20 off. Go to beamorganics.com slash jce. Use the code JCE at checkout. Beam, B E A M organics.com slash JCE. You will sleep till the sun shines out your ass. That's right. I understand Beam sponsored the Adam Cole Adam Page match at the pay per view the other night. Boy, I'll tell you what, they've got severe uh, competition for the sleep inducing product of the year. That's a Beam great idea. That match. That's a Just, great idea for Beam. Every week we can have the most boring match of the week. What match put us to sleep this week? Beam sponsors it. You know what? Write that down. I like that idea, but not enough to go to the trouble of actually jotting it down to remember later. But if you do, we'll do that. Okay. I will uh, tell Jace to do it. Jace, write that down. Yeah, Jace. Who's Jace? <laughs> oh, you mean Jay Sharknado. That's right. Okay. I knew he was changing names recently, but... But Beam! Beam! All right, in an effort to further continue delaying talking about any modern wrestling, we're actually going to talk about some logical, sensible wrestling. Because uh, we got another fan email, and this brought up a couple of things we can talk about. For the people who like discussion of old wrestling that makes sense and why things were done and how things were laid out and then the amount of ad lib that came into play and all, a variety of things. We're going to talk about this for a minute because it's my show. But Mark Cole and Mark, I I've, I've, know I owe you an interview at some point for your Odessa Steps magazine. Um, he does a fine job there. It's, it's, it's a fan publication. But uh Mark wrote in and asked a question, and this was, oh gosh, uh, not even two weeks ago, because we're approaching the anniversary of the last stampede, which would be, what now, 38 years ago this coming April and May. And we shot the angle in March. So actually, we shot the angle on, I believe it was March 16th, 
1984. I don't have the Midnight Express book in front of me. Anyway, the anniversary is coming up. We're going to have a cake, Brian, uh, just so you know. But um, as we approach the anniversary of the last stampede, I have a small question about part of the angle. When you jump Bill Watts during his interview with Butch Reed, Dennis hits Bill with a blackjack and then gives it to you and you hit Watts with it. But why did you not have your racket on you and use that to hit Watts? Had the loaded racket not been established yet as a lethal foreign object? Did Watts or Dundee think the blackjack or slapstick, as the cowboy calls it, was a more relatable weapon to the average fan? Thanks, as always. That is an excellent question. Yes, and I have a hopefully excellent answer. Um, it was uh, some of that I will try to elaborate. And, you know, we, t we talked about a couple of weeks ago, when's the first time you met CM Punk? And I was like, when it was, a, I guess we narrowed it down, it was a ring of honor, mid-2000s. But somebody on Twitter, well, how could you not remember a fateful day like that? And a lot of people forget that just because a celebrity has been a celebrity all of that person's life, it doesn't mean that celebrity was always a celebrity. I met Jeff, Jeff Jarrett for the first time when he was 12 years old. I didn't say, oh, I'm so proud to meet a future NWA World Heavyweight Champion because he was fucking 12 years old. You don't know <laughs> sometimes that you're meeting a future, you know, goddamn multiple time Hall of Famer or whatever the case. And by the same token, people th would think back now and go, well, why didn't you use the racket? Because the Road Warriors sold the racket. Dusty Rhodes sold the racket. Ric Flair sold the racket. This was March 1984. We had been in Mid-South Wrestling full-time since December, Christmas night of 1983, so two and a half months. We had made a couple of TV tapings before that starting in November. I didn't even carry the racket, the first TV taping, because I hadn't thought of it yet. So, and then for the first six weeks we were in the territory, we were wrestling underneath guys to get wins in all the house shows. So there was no reason for me to interfere because the Midnight Express didn't need to have the manager help or have a foreign object to beat the underneath and middle card guys. It was all clean finishes. Midnight Express wins. Then when we got in the program for the Mid-South Tag Team title with Wrestling 2 and Magnum TA, there were a few cases where I would we would get heat after a DQ or something and it'd be a hot, you know, afterbirth. And I used the racket a time or two. But it hadn't really been established yet. It hadn't been the, the uh, difference maker in a big match. People hadn't seen guys get knocked out by it. There hadn't been heat put on it yet. So as uh, that was still to come. Now, after six months in Mid-South, and they'd seen it on TV, and they'd seen it in the house shows, when the fans would get close, and I would draw the racket back at the fucking fans that were trying to attack us for a shoot, they'd shy away from it. They'd put their hands up, or they'd duck, or they'd lean back, or whatever, and that gave us a little fucking room. <clears throat> and that was the idea of the whole thing, but that was months later after they'd seen that. And then, by the time we got to Crockett, and then the Road Warriors, Animal takes a bump for the racket, and the racket is loaded, and it's a fearsome weapon, and Dusty Rhodes puts the racket over, and the racket busts people open, and it injures Ricky Morton. Then it became a thing. But that's that's one thing about that angle that Mark here noticed that was just a little bit different because in hindsight, in context, it didn't make sense to use the racket that was not over yet. And also, <sighs> the way Watts thought, this was not even a wrestling angle. This was ultra-legitimate because it was what was going to bring him out of retirement. In Oklahoma and Arkansas, besides Danny Hodge, Bill Watts was the all-time babyface wrestling legend in that part of the country. In Mississippi and Louisiana, he was very over. 
in uh, Texas, Watts wasn't really over that much, except that they had been seeing him do commentary on Mid-South Television when he annexed Houston in, what, 1982? But still, you got the gravitas of the situation that here is this legendary wrestler that retired from the ring to become a promoter, and he runs this whole show, and here comes these heels for the first time since his retirement. Here comes these heels that just don't give a fuck and fucked with him, and now he's going to come back. Watts wanted it to be a mugging, something uh, past a wrestling angle that would wake people up and almost force him to come out of retirement, leave his hands tied. He's got no choice but to defend himself as a man. So the way that it was put together where everybody involved in it from the start either came out looking better or had a graceful way to branch off to something else. Mr. Wrestling 2 and Magnum TA were the tag team champions. We're their most fearsome challengers they've had yet. The houses start coming up just with the title matches, but sometimes they win, we get the shit, or we kick the shit out of them after the match and keep the heat. Sometimes it's a DQ. Sometimes we won a couple of non-title matches over them. It's a, it's a dog fight with two and TA on who's going to be the better team. But finally, the night that we win the belts, it's when Wrestling 2 walks out on TA, his protege, the guy that he's been training that he's gotten disillusioned with, who was getting too popular. He's got a little jealous. So two walks out on his partner, leaves him to be beaten by the Midnight Express. We're the new tag team champions. Are there going to be rematches? No, because there's no longer a fucking former tag team championship team. They just split up. That means the heels got the last word on the baby faces but the baby faces don't look bad because two is now a heel. The team is split up and TA before he can find another partner and try to regain his belts back has to go and settle the issue with wrestling too. That's a, called a graceful exit. That's the way that the heels get the final word on the baby face, but it doesn't leave the baby face stand there with their dicks in their hands with nothing to do. So now they're out of the picture. Now the Rock and Roll Express have come into the territory and ever they've already, the fans have started chanting for them and they've already started fantasizing about the idea, what about the Rock and Roll in this Midnight Express? And Watts gave them the one little six-minute match on TV just to give them a taste of what it would look like. And then, now that we're the new tag team champions, we come out on TV and I have the celebration, the party. The cake party. We don't have that. We've just, we've split up two and TA. We're the new tag team champions. Nobody can beat us. I'm crowing. And the, obviously this was a Bill Dundee angle because Bill Watts just didn't decide one day, I'm going to have a cake party on Mid-South Wrestling. You know, all the former NFL players I book love cake parties, right? This was a, a Tennessee angle, but it worked because they had never seen it before. And you've got me, this little fucking nerd, rich kid, pussy, smartass, loudmouth, having this ridiculous party with the confetti and the cake and the noisemakers celebrating that the team that my mother purchased for me are the new tag team champions of all of Mid-South Wrestling, and the people are fucking hating it in the, in the, uh, the building. Fuck you. Piece of shit, right? Blah, blah, blah. And of course, as this goes on just long enough, here comes the Rock and Roll Express to run out when I go to cut the cake and smashes my face in a cake. And the people threw babies in the air. Again, they'd never seen this before. One of the reasons why Tennessee bullshit, as they used to call it in the business, got over in other places is because they'd never seen it before. Some of the things in Tennessee got redone a little bit too much and they lost some of the effect, concession stand brawls. But when you, when you let that, those angles go out into other territories that were fresh and you didn't overdo it, it meant so much more because it was different. So 
they smash my face in a cake and I'm down there and the people are just laughing and, and they've humiliated me. If they'd have come out and taken a blackjack and hit me over the head and busted me open, the people would have seen what all they wanted to see. Somebody's got to beat that motherfucker up and put him in the hospital. That's what they wanted to see. As long as they didn't see that, we still had heat. They humiliated me, but they didn't do anything to Dennis Condry and Bobby Eaton, the Midnight Express. So now it's up to us to get even. Later on in the program, they just so happen to have a little bit of extra time on the show. So Bill Watts says at the announce desk, it was so funny what happened to that no good sissy, Jim Cornette, that we're going to show that again. And they show it again, me getting my face put in a cake. And right at the end of the program, they're almost out of time. They come back from the tape, and down I come. I got no jacket on. I got no tie on. I'm still covered in cake around my fucking, in my hair and all over the place, and I'm pissed. And when Watts and Dundee had sat down with us to go over this particular angle, this is where the blackjack comes in. It was Dundee's angle, yes, but because Watts was involved and he was the boss and he is a control freak, he was going to lay it out to us. And we mentioned, Brian, a couple of the shows we did a couple of weeks ago. Did I ever get stage fright? Was I ever scared to do a promo or whatever? I said, I, I was always nervous about fucking shit up if it wasn't a promo, if it, wasn't, if it was physical, if it wasn't in my wheelhouse. I forgot. It. I must say I was scared shitless on this promo for two reasons. Number one, I wasn't anxious for the slap that I knew was coming because I wasn't sure whether I was going to be able to talk for real afterwards or not. But mostly I was scared shitless because it's not just me going out there and doing the promo. I got to work back and forth with Watts. He's got to say the right thing. I got to have the answers. We got to do the right thing. And I didn't... Go ahead. What were you going to say? I never thought of this before, and I know you had seen some tapes, but before you got to Mid-South in 84, just the nature of what got around and what didn't in the pre-VHS era and then in the early VHS era, were you aware of just how good Watts was on the mic before you got there? Well, yes, I was aware of how good he was on the mic because the Mid-South Wrestling Show aired in Greenwood, Mississippi, which was close enough Somehow, was it the Greenwood footage or what? No, Little Rock. I'm sorry, Little Rock. Tell a lie. Little Rock. Mid-South Wrestling aired on TV in Little Rock. Randy Hales lived in Jonesboro. Randy Hales could get <laughs> the Little Rock TV on his antenna, and he started taping some of those early Mid-South TVs and giving them to me in exchange for, you know, because we were fucking tape freaks at the time. So I'd seen Watts as an announcer and as the promoter in Mid-South Wrestling. I had also seen the old uh, tape that circulated of him versus Terry Funk in a TV match that's still out there today. You can find on YouTube. And I knew that he was, from what the boys said, as soon as we got there, noted for being a fucking stiff bastard. And, and it, it was funny, as one of the ribs was when Bobby and Dennis started working with Watts, it was, a, it was a rib, but it was true, they found out. They thought it was a rib until the first night. When he would grab you and shoot you off and call drop kick, he wasn't going to fucking drop kick you. You were going to get a big punch right in the fucking face. That was his drop kick, right? <laughs> so he just stayed on the ground and punched and kicked and did the fucking Oklahoma stampede, and that's, you know, but he was stiff. He wanted shit to look good. And what did he do? So, uh, well, we'll get to the few, but he tore his hamstring the first night. Was that what it was? It wasn't, it wasn't the first night. It was like the first week or so. <laughs> it, well, no, maybe it was a couple of weeks in. He, uh, but yeah, he tore his hamstring kicking Bobby and Dennis in the head to get juice on him. <laughs> because the deal we did, he did the old spot with Dennis because Dennis came up with it what would happen was he would grab Dennis by the face and he'd rake his eyes. And when Dennis would bend over and grab his eyes, like, Oh my God, my eyes, Dennis would tense his hands up in a cup over his face. And Watts would then just draw back and punt football kick the hands. 
And it would look like he kicked him right in the face for good reason, because most time the kick was stiff enough that the hands went into the face, right? But that's the way he'd just get juice on guys by just kicking them right in the fucking head flush. So, but anyway, back to the deal. So when Watts and Dundee are laying it out, that's when Watts taught me several things all in this, in this, you know, one segment. I come out and I'm pissed and I'm getting him in his face and he's blowing me off. I'm not, he's not going to dignify me. I'm not worth his time, but I keep going and he starts to turn away and I grab him and pull him back. No, you're going to listen to me. And after a couple of times of that, then he said, okay, I'm going to say, that's it. And he'd grab my hand that I was poking him in the chest with my finger. He'd grab my hand. He'd say, that's it, sissy. I've had enough of you. I've tried to walk away <laughs> twice now. I lose track of my words when it comes to people like you, and I resort to physicality, and you're not man enough to stand up to it. So I'm going to walk away from you. Consider yourself lucky, whatever. And right as he turns the third time, I'm going to go to stop him. You can't walk away from me, and he's going to spin around and slap the shit out of me, right? Boom. So when we actually got in the confrontation, I was fired up and I was giving it to him. Marshall Dillon, you think you stand for right and might, blah, blah, blah. And he did the first two and he was going to break in and do the third one. I said, no, wait a minute. I got more to say. And I cut him off because I was on a roll and I said, I got to fucking do it because I want to get this shit in, right? But at the same time, I'm still, I've been there for two months. This is Bill Watts, and he's the boss. I'm I'm telling him to shut up on his television program, for real. So I'm like, this better be good. Again, I didn't know, <laughs> on some level, I knew that this is the most important thing I'll ever do in wrestling. But no, if they had sat me down and actually told me the truth in, in English, this will be the most important thing you ever do in wrestling and will make your career. Fuck. I I don't know about that. I would have probably shit myself, but I knew it subliminally, but it it was just we want to do this well. We're thinking this this we're getting a chance here. So anyway, I finish up with the fucking deal where I said, I'm gonna have your stupid geeky looking son Joel. He's gonna be working for me, he's gonna be swabbing out toilets and selling midnight express souvenirs. And that's when he got the chance to turn and walk away. And the one thing that I knew was I said, I'm at least going to make this as easy on myself as possible. I'm going to feed for this and I'm going to see what happens because he can't say I moved and he can't say he didn't get a good shot or I blocked it or whatever. And that way, if I live through it, you know, then everything's great. And if he breaks my jaw, then it wasn't my fault. So when he turns, he's turning to the right to walk away from me and instead of grabbing him his left arm with my left arm which would have meant that not only when he spun back around my left arm would have been in the way of his slap swing but also if you do that you're a little close to the guy and a close slap is one of those ones where it's so quick that the whole everybody doesn't see what happened right you see so you want to be able to do the whole swing and see the contact instead of the guys being too close so I reached and grabbed his left arm with my right arm and kept him from turning. That way, I'm ready to go to my right when he hits me. And when he spins around with his right arm to slap me, my left arm isn't in the way and my head's there. And he had a perfect target. He didn't hit my cheekbone. He didn't hit my lips. He didn't cup my ear and break my eardrum. He put that fucking catcher's mitt of a hand of his right under my jawbone on the fucking side of my neck, right there, and hit me as hard as he could. And I was already determined I was going to go to the right no matter what happened, and it gave me a little extra fucking momentum, and it knocked me ass over tea kettle, and boom, and I sell it like I'm, I've been hit by the baseball bat. And I try to stand up, and I stagger, and I fall to my knees, and I, and I crawled all the way back to the locker room up the, I crawled up the stairs of the Irish <laughs> McNeil Boys Club. Crawled up the stairs. It wasn't even on camera. But I, there was, what they hold, 750 people in there. There was 750 people or whatever it was watching me do this. 
And then the the next chapter, now they've not only humiliated me, but Watts has slapped the taste out of my mouth. You know, one and, of the... Right, go ahead. I was just going to say, you know, one of the great things about that angle too is as you start interrupting Watts and yelling at him, he looks at Jim Ross a few times and Jim Ross has to like sell it with his face. Like, ooh, you know, I can't believe he's saying this to you. But I always thought the little looks to Jim Ross were great. Yeah, because nobody had ever talked to him like that. And especially now, you know, if a 300 pound former football player did it, it'd be one thing, but me, right? That was, that was the most biggest insult to the bunch. This little fucking pipsqueak, right? Can I ask you a so, question about part two, what you're about to go to? Please do. And you could wait if you want to address it when you get there. But the way you just laid out how everything was explained to you beforehand, one of the most underrated parts, but it's kind of awesome, is Butch Reed walking away. Well, yes. So I just, you're going to explain that too. Was that part, did you know that was going to happen the way it happened? Oh, yes. Because here's the thing. Now, Watts has done this to me, and that was the end of the television program. But we taped two shows in the same night. So the next TV, obviously, you know, one would think we need to do something. But he wanted again to make it legitimate. Instead of it just happening that we would come out on the TV program, they said, ladies and gentlemen, on the next week's TV, ladies and gentlemen, a shocking incident has occurred. We were taping interviews for upcoming matches before we went on the air tonight. And in one of them, Bill Watts was interviewing Hacksaw Butch Reed about his upcoming match with, and it was Duggan, whoever it was. We want to show you what happened. Well, then they go to a pre-taped interview where Watts is interviewing Butch Reed. And suddenly, I come out, and I'm standing about 10, 15 feet away, but I'm yelling at Watts, and I'm calling him a whatever I'm calling him, right? Nothing you can't say on television. And Watts just tells Reed, oh, that's that sissy cornet. Ignore him. Just uh, go on, Butch. Even if Butch Reed's a heel, right? But <laughs> Yeah. But uh, he said, go on, ignore that sissy. Okay, can we get him out of here? He was the top right singles heel. In the company. Yes, yes. And right as Watts has had enough of me heckling and interrupting this interview and looks off camera, the Midnight Express, Bobby and Dennis come from the side door out in the parking lot, come into the building with a blackjack, and Dennis fucking whacks Watts over the head with the, with the blackjack, and down he goes, and the Midnight Express gets on him. When they were laying this out in the locker room beforehand, when Watts was, he told Butch, he said, Butch, he said, when this happens, you've got to realize that regardless of what else is going on, they, these guys have gone too far and you don't want any part of it. You don't try to help. You're still an asshole. You're still a prick that everybody hates. And they, it was dog he was talking about, junkyard dog. And they want dog to kick your ass, but you don't want any of this. This is not even wrestling. This is a criminal assault. You hold your hands up. You signify that you have nothing to do with this. You didn't know it was going to go on, and you walk away. Because, honest, that's logical. That little touch right there, just Butch Reed walking away and then turning around at one point to see it. And like you said, he put his hands up like, oh, I have nothing and to do with shake, this. Shaking his head like, hey, don't try to pin any of this. This guy has committed some of the most heinous offenses in all of Mid-South Wrestling, and he don't want any of this. And so then again, the racket never came up because Watts wanted to be wanted it to be a criminal assault. Use that's where I first learned how to make a blackjack. Fucking nice black dress sock, fucking cardboard toilet paper roll, uh, some fucking coins to give it some weight and some noise, and some toilet paper around it to cushion the so the quarters don't ding your head too bad. And it bounces real nice. Watts got juice for it. But that's why he said, you come in from, the wrestlers come in from behind. They hit me over there with a blackjack. And he said, I go down and gig. And then they hold me up and you give the, Dennis, you give the blackjack to Cornette. And Cornette, you hit. Now he's been attacked from behind. He's being held by two grown men while me, the sissy, fucking hits him over his bloody head repeatedly with a blackjack 
And the only thing, honestly, I got carried away and I think I used it three or four times and I shouldn't have. And I actually learned if it was five times yeah. he got hit with a black jacket, it caved his fucking head in. But just like he went overboard with the strap with Bobby Fulton. Yeah, well, and that, but that <laughs> tends to know, happen. <laughs> it tends to happen in these moments of, uh, you know, and, and, it, but anyway, that was the thing. So then, boom, once we've done that, then here comes all the top baby faces to make the save. Within 30 to 45 seconds is what the, for the attack went on because even though you couldn't see it on television, I mentioned the stairs in the Irish McNeil Boys Club, it would take you close to 30 seconds to see something on the monitor in the locker room, run as fast as you could out the door, down this long flight of stairs, and 50 or 60 feet to the ring. And so it didn't look like, well, where is anybody going to help? They, they had a ways to come. So once the top baby faces get there, we bail, we bail out of the situation. We've done our damage. I tossed Dennis the blackjack. You can even hear Jim Ross saying, well, he's got that blackjack. They're giving him plenty of room because we're running away. The baby faces would have tried to get us, but we've got a weapon and now they're going to see about their bloody boss. But there wasn't this two and three minutes with no help and nobody do anything where this, we were just allowed to do whatever we wanted. We got in, we did our attack. It was a street mugging and people got there as quickly as they reasonably could and ran us off. Now the people are madder at us than they were before we won the fucking belts. They're madder at us than after we won the belts, but before I was humiliated because now we've gotten the final word. It's a roller coaster of emotions. They were mad we won the belts. They laughed at me with the cake in my face. They really laughed at me when I got slapped, but then they got madder at us for hurting Watts. Then he comes back the next week and makes the announcement that, ladies and gentlemen, I had retired as a professional wrestler years ago and moved into promotion. I put that part of my life behind me. And I'm not in shape to come back and be a full-time wrestler again. But as a man, I cannot stand by and let these people do what they've done to me. As a man, I've got to come back one time, one last stampede. I mean, it's not for any titles. It's not for any championships. It's not a long campaign. It's one time to right a wrong. And by the time he finished doing his stump speech, everybody within the range of that television knew that they've got one more chance in their life to see Bill Watts in a wrestling ring. And by God, he's going to fucking torture and fucking humiliate the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette when he does it. And the only thing he needs is a partner, somebody to fight with me. Well, Junkyard Dog was out of that. No, it wasn't a match with Butch Reed and Junkyard Dog because JYD was out of the territory. He'd lost the loser leave. That's why Watts had to go find Stagger Lee, bad to the bone. JYD's alter ego that the people in Mid-South Wrestling knew when DiBiase had fucked him around. Stagger Lee a few years before came in and got even. So now... The biggest babyface in the history of Arkansas and Oklahoma wrestling has gone and got the biggest babyface in the history of Louisiana and Mississippi wrestling and Houston. And we're all going to get the chance to see Watts one more time put an end to the Midnight Express and Jim Cornette. Now they're hopeful. Now they're excited. It, it, it was a roller coaster of emotions. And as I said, you know, context with the, would it have been better to do the racket? No, the blackjack was better. It was a street crime. This, there wasn't anything entertaining about this. Nothing could be seen as funny or tongue in cheek. It was goddamn. And here's the thing. Then Dundee having the Memphis fucking mindset that Watts didn't have. Watts, you know, if it had been Watts booking it, to be honest, he said, okay, I'll beat the Midnight Express, and then I'll get a couple of minutes with Cornette. We'll get juice on him. We'll do what we did with Akbar or whatever. And Dundee, no, 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 no. You don't beat Cornette up. You don't beat him bloody. You humiliate him. He can always come back from that because of the mouth. So the stipulations that people paid for 
that as a matter of fact, people paid just the, that five weeks in that territory over a million dollars in 1984 money. We sold like, what was it? Goddamn, however many hundred thousand tickets in, in four or five weeks to these matches to see Watts either put me in my mother's pink dress, strip me down and put me in my mother's pink dress and parade me around like an idiot, or strip me down and put me in a diaper and feed me a bottle of milk. And that sounds like the most ridiculous shit that you could ever come up with, and people would be laughing like crazy, right, through the whole thing. They just couldn't even take it seriously. I've never had in one... <laughs> I had more people over that five weeks time that we were wrestling Watts and I was getting dressed in a dress or a diaper try to physically assault me than in the next two or three years put together. Including, as I've mentioned, some of our biggest fucking hoo-hahs when the police in Tulsa were taken out and I was running by myself back to the locker room and they almost destroyed Watts' Rolls Royce with the shit they were throwing at me. In a dress. I had more. It, it, yes. I had more heat coming out of that because they didn't beat me up and hurt me. But they humiliated, and people paid to see me humiliated. And again, they took it as serious as a heart attack because when we were getting the heat in those matches, people, if I've said this a million times, the people would not have let us left the building if we'd have beaten Watson Dog. They would have strung us up themselves. So, it's not about the preposterousness of the angle or the stipulations. It's how legitimate you can make the emotions behind those stipulations and the, the grudge and the, the bad feeling and the angle and the ill will, whatever the case, the confrontation, the conflict. If the people and the conflict are legitimate, then they'll go with the other stuff. But if you just do the other stuff first, it doesn't mean shit. So basically from then on, it was just promos. We never touched Watts again from that first attack until we got in the ring with him several weeks later. They never touched us on TV again. It was all promos. If we win, I take over Mid-South Wrestling and Watts and his kid work for me. If he wins, then I get the diaper or the baby bottle. That was, We just talked about it, and it did the record fucking gate, not just for Mid-South Wrestling, but for wrestling and the history of wrestling. In almost every town, we $7,000 short in the Superdome, Michael Hayes and Junkyard Dog. You still had that one. but <clears throat> um, You know what I think one of the most underrated parts of the angle is, is the week after. Because the week after, if you go back and check out that show, Two-thirds of the show are all about the last stampede. The show opens with you at the desk in yeah. Bill Watts's chair, looking as smug as ever. And they're going over the highlights of you attacking Bill Watts. Then we get the announcement of Stagger Lee. And then we get videos of Stagger Lee. We get videos of you storming off at the news. Then we get videos of Jim Ross blindfolded being brought to Stagger Lee. It ends up being it. I've never seen anything. Nobody, nobody was supposed to know where he was. It was a secret. Right. Other than the cameraman, I guess. But yeah. it ends up well, being... Well, that was, that was Joel Watts. and Everybody knew that, too. <laughs> was Joel Watts the cameraman for that? I think, I think he was. He was doing the editing at the time. A lot of the video. I don't... Maybe it was Scott Munz. I don't know. But two-thirds of that show in Mid-South Wrestling didn't do that, where they just dedicated an entire show. Usually, maybe the first 10 minutes, they'll focus on the hot angle the week before. But the entire show was building up that match right away. Well, and he knew, you know, that it's either, now that we've done it, it's either all or nothing. And he didn't want his return out of retirement to fall on its face after all that. Well, let me ask you this. Based on things you've said to me in the past, so the week you attack Watts with the Express, and then the next week is you on commentary with the revelation that Stagger Lee has been found, that's the episode that Actually, aired. no, no, no. The, the next week was not the revelation of Stagger Lee. It was a week after that, wasn't it? Because they didn't... 
the, the the problem with the only problem we've talked about this the only problem was that they didn't count their Dundee was new in the territory with the bicycle of the tape because he was used to the live TV and only one week delay in Memphis and they didn't show the announcement of Stagger Lee until five o'clock the day of the show in New Orleans or we would have done better. Well, that was going to be my question. Does that mean this was the episode that aired in New Orleans the day of the Superdome show? Yes. So I guess I guess it was. So yeah, well, that, yeah. Because the Superdome was the first Saturday in April and we shot the angle the middle of March. So yeah, we had two to three TVs. Basically, the TV I got slapped, the cake in the face and I got slapped. Then the TV where we attacked Watts. And then the next week's TV, they did announce Staggerly. We had three weeks of TV from start to finish to go to the Dome and did 25,000 people almost. And the week you attack Watts, like you said before, it happened early in the show. They said we were recording these promos before the show. Or they didn't right. say promos. But we were recording these interviews. interviews. Yeah. And then you sat in on commentary the rest of that show. <laughs> so those fans wanted to kill you. They hated you by that point. Yeah, it, it, was, it was... You could feel it, too. It wasn't even like the fans in Tennessee when you left the building, a boo, fuck you, you're a heel. It was like, no, we're going to find you, you son of a bitch. And that's, you know, and, and I got to give credit to Dundee also because that's where he, Dundee had always been a great finish guy, had incredible finishes and could lay them out and tell them to you where you could see them happening. That's why it was so easy to learn. But he had booked in Memphis. And like I said, a lot of this stuff had already been done too much in Memphis. But when he w went outside the territory and was able to go to Mid-South and some other places and bring this kind of stuff, he still understood how to put it together to where that if you hadn't seen it before, it had the maximum impact. And think about this. Dundee had never had a main event position in wrestling until 1975 when he came to the United States. And immediately he's on top in Tennessee with him and George Barnes, tremendous tag team. And then he got over as a single. And then it's him and Lawler, the two biggest names in the territory. But this is 1984. He'd never wrestled anywhere else in the United States. He'd never booked anywhere else. And he still had something to prove. So for a new booker to go into a territory that size and pitch to Bill Watts, yeah, we're going to smash the manager's cake in the, cake in the face. We're going to smash the manager's face to cake. And we're going to dress him in a diaper and JYD is going to feed him a baby bottle in the Superdome. He had faith in this shit and he had faith in us because he had seen what we did and he knew what we could do. So he had faith in that. But to stick your dick out on the line to tell Bill Watts, your new boss, yeah, we're going to do all this shit. If it hadn't worked, Dundee would have been back in Memphis 15 minutes later. Yeah, you know, one of the funny things about this, when you think about it, is the fact that we know that Bill Watts was one of the few people that got along with Ole Anderson, was talking to Ole yeah. Anderson. <laughs> so how's it going with that Dundee? Oh, he just did this really hot angle with uh, a cake and Jim Cornette. No, I just saw that. He did that here. It was the worst thing I ever saw. Yeah, oh, really? I it closed, did record business here. <laughs> I closed the whole territory down because they did that. That fucking Cornette and Dundee. And then Watts said, yeah, well, I just made a million dollars last month. So, and you? And and that's and and Dundee also it was so because Dundee knew that I knew what the fuck was going on with to do this. He told me the day before he said, "All right, we're doing the cake party, mate, at TV. Bring the cake party." I brought the cake. I brought the balloons. I brought the confetti and the noisemakers. I after we got out of interviews that day, I had like two or three hours. I went to fucking the grocery store and got the cake. And that's where I learned to get multiple layer cakes. Cause when it was a big giant sheet cake, when they put me through the fucking cake, my nose planted straight in the table, gave me a bloody nose. You couldn't tell because of the icing, but I was bleed. I got juice for the cake. So then I always got two layer cakes. So I had more padding, but Dundee could, I knew all the shit from Memphis. He'd, if he said, we're going to do the birthday party for the dog, we're going to do the cake party. We're going to do this angle. We're going to do that thing. I knew what to bring. And he didn't have to worry about it. We didn't have special effects people. Brian asked me if I turned the receipts in for the cake and the party favors. Did you turn the receipts in? Fuck you. <laughs> I did all, that, all the shit they asked me to do myself. I never said boo to a goose because I'm happy to be there. And 
You know what? Back that was 1984. What was that big sheet cake? Eight dollars and the fucking party favors. I probably had 25 bucks in it. I made two thousand dollars for the Superdome alone. I was okay. But anyway, that's that's what I'm saying is is that everything was thought of, and then when we had the climactic match in every town. He beat the Midnight Express. He got juice on both Bobby and Dennis. Beat him one, two, three in the ring. Then jerked me in and did the, either the dress or the diaper. And Dog loved the milk bottle. He didn't care much for the fucking pink dress, but he loved the milk bottle. Because what he would do is he would take a big swig of it and then give me the big, handsome Jimmy Valiant type of kiss and spit the milk in my mouth. Ew, why, why did he like that? Uh, because he's fucking with me. Same thing when they had the the fucking diaper. It wasn't a baby diaper. It was a goddamn sheet. Because I was a full grown adult, right? But they got this gimmick, fucking uh, uh safety pin that was like eight or ten inches long, and you could see it in the balcony. And Watts would do the deal where he'd open it and he'd poke me with it in the stomach. And I'm doing, I'm on my back, I'm kicking and ah. And he was really poking me, so I got a head. You got a good reaction out of it, right? I'm fuck motherfucker but after that and that's where watts had told dundee and he told us this later on watts had told dundee well after this program they're going to be done we can't do the rock and roll you know they're all the heat will be off of them we got to send them on off nope mate don't worry we come right out of this do the thing with the rock and roll it'll be fine we still had the belts because the match with watts and dog wasn't for the title so we were still the tag team champions and again Yes, he beat Bobby and Dennis and bloodied them both, but then they had to leave. And that was another thing that was dangerous. I had to make the trip with only police back from that ring every night with those people trying to get at me and not even the boys to, you know, be around me, right? But by the time they kept me in the ring and did all that shit and humiliated me, the people had forgotten that the Midnight Express got beat. The memory that they took was that fucking Cornette got humiliated. And that's what they paid to see, so they were happy. And as soon as they saw that match in the arena, they went and watched TV the next week, or two weeks, depending on how the bicycle of the tape went. And they saw the Midnight Express fuck around the Rock and Roll Express. And now I'm whacking that Reggie Morton with the racket. Well, that no good son of a bitch, he didn't learn. Everything made sense. Everybody had a place to go. Everybody came out looking better. Everybody got paid. And nobody could say, well, why the fuck did they do that? That didn't make any sense. And as we all know, when they're sitting there gigging each other in the ribs with their elbow, hey, did you see that? That don't make any sense. Then they're not paying attention to what you're trying to sell them. Do you remember who you guys worked with on the episode where you attack Watts? Uh, no, I don't actually. One of the names I could have guessed, the other one I wouldn't have. Josh Stroud and Obi Davis. Oh, <laughs> Josh Stroud was a fucking heck of a guy. He was a a muscle builder and a bodybuilder, but he he could work a little bit. But he just started. But he was a great athlete, a black guy, looked like a million dollars. And I think what didn't Obi. He looked like a million dollars too, uh, dirty, green, and wrinkled. <laughs> I don't think he would quite look the same as Josh Stroud, but I don't know whatever happened to Josh Stroud. He he might could have gone somewhere. Well, he did go somewhere because we never saw him again. But he might could have achieved success. But but uh, you know that it it just it just needs to make sense and don't slap you in the face with all the loopholes of why that this couldn't actually take place. You know, Brian, though, the one thing that Bill Watts didn't have back then, he had all the wrestling knowledge, had all the logic, all the psychology. He didn't have a lot of hair. As a matter of fact, one of the things I used to say was, Bill Watts, you like to say you walk tall. Well, you're walking so tall, the top of your head's coming all the way through your hair. (laughs) And he actually, when I did that line... The night on TV, he came back to me in the locker room. He said, yeah, you know, good line about that. You know, I've got the male pattern baldness. It runs in my family. And he was justifying his hair loss. The point is, 
that like Cowboy Bill Watts, two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time they're 35 years old and he was in his 40s then. More than 50 million men in the United States, especially in Bixby, Oklahoma, suffer from male pattern baldness. And if they'd only had our friends at Keeps back in Louisiana in 1984, Bill Watts right now would, well, my God, he'd, he just, he'd have an afro. He'd just have a giant head of hair. If only he could have started back. Can you imagine what 40 years on Keeps would do for you, folks? Keeps offers the only two FDA-approved medications that can actually prevent hair loss, but they offer the generic versions of both, so they're not going to rake you over the coals and make you empty your bank account just to keep your head full and warm. 24-7 Care and Support Keeps has a network of expert medical advisors, prescribers, care specialists, and all kinds of people. They even have actually, well, if you need a little company some nights, maybe the 24-7 Care Support can work on that too if you got a nice head of hair and you're attractive. They've got convenient virtual doctor consultations and medications delivered straight to your door. Every three months, if you don't answer your door, they'll leave it outside the window. Treatment plans are affordable, typically half the cost of prices at these pharmacies that you might go to. They start at just $10 a month because of the generic versions, and prevention is the key, folks. The key to keeps is prevention, because treatments can take up to four to six months to see the results, so act fast. But if you stick with it, we've had plenty of testimonials from members of the cult of Cornette that say that they look more like Lon Chaney Jr. and the Wolfman than they do Egghead from Batman. When it comes to your hair, save more and spend less. Folks, if you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to Keeps, K-E-E-P-S dot com slash J-C-E to get your first month of treatment for free. That's Keeps dot com slash J-C-E to get your first month of treatment for free. Boy, I tell you what, you just got to Slather this on, but watch out, you know, if you get too much on your hands, you'll have to comb your knuckles. Keeps.com slash JCE. That's right, Keeps. And of course, we have to keep moving along here with the experience. Your show, I don't know why I'm pushing it along. You should be Yeah, the one. Why, are, why are you pushing me along? And by the way, are you still combing your knuckles or did you get the, that taken care of? I have not had to comb my knuckles, but it uh, sounds like a nice problem to have. Well, it's better than sitting in a corner licking your eyebrows, I'll tell you, but you do get a lot of girls that way. Anyway, on uh, this past week, should we talk about the wrestling now? Should, is, have we got anything else to talk about? Cooking recipes? How you doing with your French toast? Don't you have any more of those why is my, what is my, how we is could, my? We could look one up real quick. Why, why is my taint? Should my taint be next? Or what about why is my fernum? Why is my fernum vibrating? See, I already regret suggesting anything more with this segment. I don't know why I brought it up. Well, Let's talk us, about wrestling. To keep us from talking about wrestling. But here it goes. This past Monday night, it was raw. It was, it was actually raw and painful. Uh, and, and also blistered, awfully dry, itchy, scratchy, <laughs> wet. So... <sighs> Did you watch this program or some of it? Did you skip through it? Did you try to find the high points? You know, this is the sad state of affairs. I'm not sure. <laughs> because the last few weeks I've been on Mondays when I'm working at my desk, I have Raw on in the background and I'll try to pay attention and I'll listen to anything that looks like it's important to listen to. And for the life of me, I can't remember if I did it this past Monday because every episode just seems the same. Well, I'll remind you. It started out with Seth Rollins and Kevin Owens in the ring. Remember, they were overly excited about to be the new tag team champions. They're finally about to secure their spots at WrestleMania. They're trying to still tell people that two of their biggest stars are not going to be on WrestleMania, and they're all upset about this. And remember last week, they wanted to beat Alpha Academy for the tag team title so they'd be on WrestleMania, but that didn't work out. And they showed VTR of all of that and then played Alpha Academy's music. The music starts out with Gable going, shush, please. And now he, they're ripping off the fucking 
opposition's YouTube show with the fucking goof that says shush all the time. Remember that? The librarian? That's right. Now Gable, an Olympic wrestler, is saying shush. And he also said last week's victory was erroneous. I don't know it. To be honest, I watched that match, and it didn't stimulate any of my erroneous zones. But the point is, on the, they're all heels. Gable's knocking the town again. He talks like a child. Otis is his simple-minded fucking cohort. They're knocking the fans. Seth and Owens are loudmouth, obnoxious heels. I, it, it's like they just want to send stuff out that people will not only boo, but actively go, I don't want to see any of these people. Because there was nobody to root for. Then they they did a dissolve. You know what? Instead of a cut, a dissolve is like the the a dissolve, a transition in, in television or movies. They did a dissolve from the Alpha Academy bitching at ringside and telling people to shush to a backstage interview with Riddle and Orton. And so they're really getting artsy. I've never seen anybody just break from a fucking, something's going on in the ring. There's a team in the ring. There's a team with microphones talking to them. And they just decided to do a dissolve to a backstage interview. And then Riddle and Orton do their entrance and birds fly out of Riddle's ass and they go to the break. They come back and apparently it was a triple threat three-way tag team championship match between Owens and Rollins and Gable and Otis and Riddle and Bro. And it was 17 minutes into the show before the bell rang to start the first match. Now, is this starting to bring back any unpleasant memories? I faintly remember some of this in the background, <laughs> and I remember thinking, I don't need to watch this. Well, you didn't, but it, it I'll tell you what. They started out going 100 miles an hour, and I'm like, I can't do another triple threat match on a three-hour show. How many three-ways we just seen in the last two weeks? And I swear to God, it went on and on. And finally, Riddle stole the pin from Rollins and beat Gable for the belt. So Rollins and Owens are still not on WrestleMania. They're still not the tag team champions, but Riddle and Bro are. And Rollins and Owens had to sit there and act like they were heartbroken. Owens was just sitting there in the fetal position, staring off into space. And Rollins was just standing there slack jawed like he'd had a lobotomy and Orton and bro or bro and Orton or bro and brittle or whichever one they do an in-ring promo. This whole thing was over with. It was 51 minutes into the television program. By the time that the first match and or related business was done, that's how they're getting by with these three hour shows. Everything takes vastly longer amounts of time than it should. And then we, oh, did you have any comments on that match you didn't watch, young Brian? No. Good. No comments. For the 24 set, do you know who the 24 seven champion is now, Brian? Oh, the last time I saw it was, uh, I think it was Reggie or was well, it Dana Brooke? It was one of those Dana, two. It's Dana Brooke. Reggie, I think, used to have it. But now Reggie and Dana Brooke are an item. They're boyfriend, girlfriend, a paramour and parami, whatever the fucking... They got a thing. But now the 24-7 title that is the joke, phony, fake title that is used for celebrities and inanimate objects is now on Dana Brooke, and she's defending it against Tamina. This was what was in the ring at the top of the nine o'clock Eastern hour when people are switching around from their previous program. And it used to be one of Vince McMahon's things, you know, Vince and his things. What's at the top of the hour? What's in the ring at the top of the hour? What are they going to see when they're flipping by at the top of the hour? They saw Dana Brooke defending the 24 seven title against Tamina. So he's forgotten what he used to know. Then was it the a good Miz, match? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Then the Miz was in the ring. See, I just keep moving along. And apparently Cleveland, Ohio, where Raw was taking place, is the Miz's hometown. And he's out there in his magenta suit and sunglasses. It looked like a... It was the exact same color, and the glasses were the exact same shade as a leisure suit that Dennis Condry had in 1975. And that's the last time it was in fashion. And apparently... Logan Paul is from Cleveland also of the the famous Paul brothers that's one that he's fighting on WrestleMania. They're fucking with the Mysterios, right? Him and him and Miz. And so they start they're the heels and they're talking about Cleveland. And I start fast forwarding because I don't care about either of these people. But then suddenly I see Jerry Lawler. So I stop it and immediately back up. They brought out Lawler because he's from Cleveland. Because a lot lot of people know, and he's obviously went over this. He used to live in Cleveland when he was a kid before he moved back to Memphis in the mid-60s. And uh, that's why he's been a lifelong fan of the Cleveland Browns, the Cleveland Indians, the Cleveland Storm and Vermin, or whatever the fuck other sports teams they have there. So I've watched this, and... (sighs) It's like when they bring on uh, local TV news the plastic, you know, prepackaged news anchors that they have now bring on some local TV personality that started in the radio days that's just so smooth and so conversational and so talented and has been on live television or live broadcasting for thousands and thousands of hours. He's just natural. He just, they didn't have anything for him to do. He just, he comes out and puts Cleveland over. People are glad to see him. And then Miz can turn on Cleveland and say, but it's not a WrestleMania city after Lawler suggests they have WrestleMania there sometime. Well, this isn't a WrestleMania city because, you know, nobody lives here anymore. The Browns left. Everybody, winners leave Cleveland. And basically the Miz and Paul turn heel on Cleveland and then leave. And leave Lawler standing there in the ring going, what's the matter with those guys? That was it? That was it. And I swear, they they were obviously talking about their WrestleMania business, but not really, and, and nothing happened. And they were babyface in Cleveland until they healed Cleveland, and Lawler had to come out because he was taken up for Cleveland, but... If you weren't from Cleveland, I don't know if you would have particularly enjoyed this or not. Are you from Cleveland? No. You didn't enjoy this then? I don't think You don't so. remember watching it? I don't think I enjoyed it. <laughs> I don't think I enjoyed it. All right, here's one of the things that came up next that I watched this program for. And boy, you can really tell there's different people in charge of Raw and NXT. Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler had a tag team match against Tommaso Ciampa and Rex Bronsteiner. And these guys, the four of them, have been the best things lately about Raw and NXT, with the exception of Brock Lesnar. And so I think I'm going to enjoy this match. Now, remember the first match on the show, by the time that they talked and talked and talked some more and then wrestled and wrestled and wrestled some more, and then talked some more afterwards, just that one piece of business was 50 solid minutes. Well, (laughs) this tag match, they do two minutes. They go to the break on a nothing spot. They come back. Champa sells for 30 seconds, makes a comeback, simultaneous cold tags. They make a comeback. They have a little four-way, and Steiner hit his finish on Ziggler. One, two, three. On NXT, they're the best thing on the show. On this marathon bore fest called Raw, they get five-minute blasé matches to just promote that they're going to be on NXT the following night. And then they don't give give them a chance to do anything that the people would say, wow, I got to see that on NXT. And then NXT is good. But people wouldn't know that from what they saw on Raw. 
both Robert Rood and, and Steiner are, well, I mean, all these guys are great, but I love Steiner working with Rude. All four of the guys, they would have fit in the NWA in the glory period with the Midnight Express, the Horsemen, Tully and Arn, Wyndham, the Steiners, the Rock and Roll. Rude and Ziggler and or Champa and Steiner just at his level of experience, you can tell they would have fit right in with those guys and been able to work matches with those guys. And there's not a lot of, of talent today that you can say that about, that they could have jumped right in with those guys and hung with them. I'm not talking about doing stunts or playing on the trampoline. I'm talking about working. But these, these four guys are, mm, but they get no time on Raw. Did you see any of that? I didn't, but last week I got to see the Ziggler match that was on Raw, and obviously I got to see NXT, and it is puzzling the way they're being used from one show to the other, from one night to the next night. It is a puzzle. On the same channel. I, it just doesn't on the same sense. network, yeah. So the next match on Raw was almost against Apollo Crews with his cohort Major Sneeze. Was Apollo Crews not on top and a main event guy at one point? I don't think so. Well, I mean, Apollo Crews, it, it, people were, I mean, they gave him that ridiculous Zimbabwean warrior gimmick where he was carrying a spear and whatever the fuck, but he, they were using him, were they not? And did I imagine this, that he was in at least something featured, some main event somewhere, they were doing something. I don't know. I kind of remember them always treating him like a jerk off since they signed him and brought him up. He was Uha Nation, wasn't he? Was that was his name on the Indies? And then, I uh, there you people go. People were well, buzzing over him, and they put him in NXT, gave him a new name, and now he's on the main roster. And no one gives a shit. He got offense last time I saw him. I believe he had an actual match. This one he didn't. <laughs> so he's pissed somebody off. Apollo Cruz has pissed in the wrong post toasties. Because this was longer than most almost matches. So to compensate for that, they moved at a glacial pace and basically did a slow squash match. And then Major Sneeze comes in and faces off with almost. And uh, one of the announcers says, well, look at that. He's almost as big as he is or whatever. And then they just, nothing happened. They just stared at each other with a mean look. And, and... Almost laughed at, at sneeze. <sighs> then it was time for Edge and AJ's package. <laughs> that, have you ever seen Edge's package? Beth Phoenix likes it. Edge and AJ had a package of last week when Edge lost his mind and switched heel on AJ. And here comes Edge out for an entrance in blue lighting. Do you know when you're in a hotel room in some distant city and they've got that's that fluorescent light that's kind of yellowish and it brings out every zit and boil and blemish and pimple and canker and fucking blister and and any type of imperfection in your face and your skin and you look like hell warm death warmed over that is what this blue light did to Edge. Did you see this? Did you see he looked like a Viking whose ship had hit an iceberg somewhere? I did not see that here. However, you're describing the way he's been looking the last few weeks, especially with the way they've been lighting him in the ring while he's been sitting in the chair giving his speech. Yeah, that blue light is not uh, cosmetically pleasing. He looked like a Viking fear monger. See, I just popped Travis Heckle. He's got to be old. Yeah, he's old enough. If you lived in Louisville, Kentucky through 1976, you saw the fear monger. So he stood there and let the fans boo him forever because uh, he tried to kill AJ last week by crushing his skull with the concerto. And then he said, you think you know me? Uh, apparently the explanation is what edge did last week. He did four AJ styles because he wants to meet the best AJ styles, the toughest AJ styles. He wants to bring out the real AJ styles so they can have a match. That's a classic and he can beat the best that AJ has. Isn't this the Jericho Kingston angle 
on the other station? And or wasn't this somebody else? I want to bring out the best in you, so I'm going to cave your head in with a sledgehammer. How many times have we seen that reasoning lately on wrestling? It's funny because Edge's feud with The Miz when that first started, it was kind of like they were mirroring some of the stuff with Punk and MJF. And now that you hear you say that, maybe Edge's whole thing now is just a steal from other people in real time. I'm not blaming Edge. He don't write this shit. I like Edge. I want to like Edge. But I cannot watch anybody deliver this rotten, dramatic writing that's so preposterous. What if, what we just talked about, it, but what if I had to come out the next week and say, you know why we hit Bill Watts over the head with that blackjack? Because we wanted him to be tougher. We want the best Bill Watts. We want Bill Watts to come out here and be able to kick our ass. So we pissed him off on purpose. No, we didn't do that. Because it wouldn't have drawn any fucking money because it's stupid. Are they? Is this a Japanese thing they're stealing it from? Do the Japanese wrestlers attack each other and cave each other's heads in with blunt instruments because they want the other guy to be tougher and give them a better fight? Well, I don't know if that's where this is coming from. I'm just wondering, they steal, they steal a lot of stuff on the other channel from Japan. I'm just wondering if that's a thing over there. Uh, they had a girls tag team match. Uh, Zelina and Vega against Morgan and Ripley. That sounds like a brand of fucking rum. Possibly a CPA firm, Morgan and Ripley. But even Rhea Ripley was not worth this at this point. This is a three-hour program. I'm needing to get through it. Did you watch the highlights of, of Madison Square Garden when uh, they glossed over that they had Austin Theory challenge Brock and instead started with Reigns' run-in so you it looks to the average fan that doesn't get on the internet like the people in Madison Square Garden got to see Reigns and Lesnar. Uh, but they... They shot it on video with a nice camera and then kept freezing every goddamn bump like they used to do the pay-per-views when they didn't want you to see a pay-per-view while the replay was still up he had to buy. They would show freeze frames. I don't... Why the, did they do that in this instance, Brian? I don't know. I know why they used to do it for pay-per-view. It made some sense, although it was annoying. Yeah. I don't know why they would do it for the MSG show unless they're planning on airing it somewhere and... All the shit looked good. The video looked good. I don't know, but eh. it was nice stuff they did ending up Brock bleeding and laying on the steps with Reigns standing over him, holding the belt, saying, acknowledge me. I think that's, if you want to go to WrestleMania, that's a good way to get there. And they did the void, the vo the voider, the Vader Hall of Fame package. And nothing wrong with that again, and I'm happy Vader's going to be going into the Hall of Fame, but did you, the Boy Meets World clip was as prominent as his wrestling clips. He's out there, He's they showed WCW stuff and WWF stuff. He's been in the ring with Hulk Hogan and Shawn Michaels and every major fucking star in the goddamn business, but it was a big deal to put a clip of his, you know, cameo appearance on a goddamn second-rate sitcom. And he said, he's a, he was a star of television. Boy Meets World could barely be considered television, right? Well, no, that's a big show for kids who grew up in the 90s. That was a big deal. I could tell you, like, people I knew who didn't like wrestling knew about Vader from that show. My cousin, who's a little younger than me, used to watch that show. He knew about Vader because of that show. Now, I oh. think mentioning it is one thing. If it's as prominent as this wrestling career, that's a problem. <laughs> See, your cousin used to watch Boy Meets World. Yeah, a lot of kids would watch that crap on ABC on Friday nights, and then they brought Boy Meets World back, and my kids started watching Girl Meets World, where the daughter of the star of Boy Meets World and his girlfriend on the show, now they have a whole nother sub-show. I, I think that's done now, too. Yeah. I want to watch Girl Meets Boy. You do? Yeah. Well, call Stephen Hirsch. Why are you bothering me with this? <laughs> Girl Meets Boy, direct from Vivid Video. Yeah, well, your cousin, the kid, watched Boy Meets. I, when I was a kid, I was watching documentaries and news programming. And, and to, to learn my mind. You had two channels. Well, yeah, and there was a documentary on one and a news program on the other. <laughs> 
Anyway, then we get to Finn Balor and Austin Theory. I'm like, okay, I'll take this. My man, Austin Theory. Finn Balor's a pro. Do you remember that I mentioned the first match on this program went 50 fucking minutes? Yeah. Well, this one didn't. Again, it was rushed. Um, And also... It, <laughs> I think they even had a match here a few weeks ago that was better than this. Theory has looked great. Balor's always, this just didn't, they did what they could do, I guess, in the time they had. But they started out, they did a bit of a match. They went to break on a floor spot that was just blob. Nobody even took a bump. It was just somebody slid out, whatever. They come back, Theory's in control. But as I'm, you know, I noted then the first match took forever. Everything else has been rushed through since then. Some of it needed to be even quicker. Balor makes a comeback. Theory stops him. They did some nice stuff back and forth. Balor, all of a sudden, boom, Theory takes a bump. He's in the place for the coup de grace. Balor goes to the top. And suddenly they've got a close up on Balor climbing to the top so that you couldn't see, but a, a hand reaches out and snatches him around the neck from off camera. It's Damian Priest. He suddenly appeared on the ring apron and snatches Balor by the neck and throws him off the top rope, disqualification. Theory completely rolls out, disappears, and Priest hits Balor with his finish and then leaves, and then Theory rolls back in, hits his finish, and takes a selfie. This is what makes Vince happy. And then something we hadn't seen yet tonight. Kevin Owens in the ring. <laughs> Damn it. They're going to get their money's worth out of him. They paying him $2 million a year. By God, you're going to be on 75 to 80 minutes of every program. And his story is still he doesn't have a WrestleMania match. Now, they've talked to Rollins in the back, by the way, earlier. I didn't even jot that down. Apparently, somebody clocked him. He had a gash on his eyelid, but he was staring off into space and would not comment on the sorry state of affairs that he's in that he's not at WrestleMania. Well, Owens, he came out, and he's going to lay this shit down. He's going to shuck this corn all the way down to the cob, tell us how he feels because he doesn't have a WrestleMania match. And so he wants to have the Kevin Owens show at WrestleMania. We've been hearing that uh, the guy I'm about to talk about may or may not now have agreed to have a match match. But he Owens wants a KO show at WrestleMania with some low life from Texas. Like, I don't know, JBL? Nah, he's a bully and an asshole. Booker T? No, nah, so he... He's not even really from Texas. He spent half his life in a team called Harlem Heat. That was a good point. Because Harlem's in New York. Yes, it is. And he mentioned Shawn Michaels, but he's, no, he can't be, he's a Canadian, he can't be sacrilegious. So none of them will do the perfect choice. The broken down shell of his former self, living on his past glory, drinking beer all day. People came up for that. Redneck, bad knees, etc. Builds up to saying, I want to, on the Kevin Owens show, Stone Cold Steve Austin, and throws the microphone down. And, and, and the announcers go, oh, my God. And, of course, the people pop when Austin's name is mentioned. You know, when you, in, in a wrestling arena, the, the phrase Stone Cold Steve Austin gets about the same response as free money. So they cheered, but Brian? If you're one to get Stone Cold Steve Austin back at a WrestleMania in Texas and have him interact in any way with anybody, couldn't you come up, even if it's Owens, I'm not saying it shouldn't be Owens, but couldn't you come up with some better motivation for Steve Austin to come back, some better happening or incident to motivate Steve Austin to come back after all these years to do a talk show or a match or a beer drinking contest or a quilting bee or whatever, then giving Kevin Steen a long-standing hatred of Texas over the last four or five weeks. 
No, this is as dumb as it can get. Just him randomly ranting about Dallas for a month, leading to Steve Austin to come back to defend the honor of Dallas. I'm not exactly sure what the point of this is. They thought they were going to have a match. Steve Austin put his foot down and said there will be no match. And now they're going to have to make the best of this that they can. They can have a bit of a skirmish. I'm sure the people will be happy about it. But before they even knew there wasn't going to be a match. By the strict definition of same. This was the idea they had. (laughs) Steen doesn't like people from Texas. What the? (sighs) Seriously? And he's, you know, if he'd been going on record for the past 10 years he's been in the company or whatever long it's been, yeah, but one thing I can't stand is those Texans. That'd be one thing. If he'd beaten up a bunch of people from Texas and laughed about it, that'd be one thing. If he goddamn mistreated a cow, well, that's going too far. But just for four or five weeks, yeah, I hate Texas. Out of the blue. Cinderella story, out of nowhere. This was, they shoehorned this reason into that fucking high-heeled slipper very, very hard. It was it was placed there with a sledgehammer. It doesn't get you excited about Austin, that's for sure. I, I, and I'm, again, what, is anybody close to Austin? Jim Ross is not there anymore to mistreat, but was anybody else close to Austin? Or does Austin have a a, a charity that somehow Steen could have maligned that he likes? Or, or even a, a fan could have been mistreated while wearing a Stone Cold Steve Austin t-shirt. You know Austin's not going to let something like that. Just anything. But I hate Texas and Dallas. Even a lot of people in, da- in Texas hate Dallas. I think those were the last words Steve said when he left Texas. I hate this shit. Last time I was down there four or five years ago, you take your life in your hands just to drive on the interstate. They're doing road construction on everything all at the same time. One of the major interstate highways around the Metroplex now is named after George fucking Bush. So you know it goes nowhere. Anyway, that was raw. Are you as raw as I was over raw? Yeah, it sounded awful. And I'll tell you what, it it was the last thing I watched before I went to bed. And normally, you know, I've talked about how good I'm sleeping lately. Normally, when I nod off into blissful slumber, into somnambulism at night, I'm just, I'm dreaming of a, a beautiful sunny morning and a healthy breakfast. And in this case, all I could think of was the bad taste in my mouth from raw. Thank goodness, Brian, I woke up and I took a big heap and helping of magic spoon and shoved it in my face and got that bad taste out of my mouth from the night before. Have you ever done that? Thank goodness. Yes, I have. You've ever, you've woke up one of these mornings, many mornings, and you've said, I can still taste last night's wrestling program. It's like a bile sitting on my tongue, but you go to the magic spoon. The healthiest cereal that tastes good as well, not garbage. You can feed this to the kids. You can feed it to your wife. Unless you don't like your wife, in which case I'd feed her some arsenic. But it's let's not, not joke about that. No one out there should be feeding anything that could be potentially deadly to their wives. And of course, Jim was joking. Magic yeah. Spoon, of course, is not deadly. It's delicious. I was, I was thinking of Aspic, I think it was. Again, don't Nevertheless. Do that. Yes. Zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only four net grams of carbs in each serving of Magic Spoon. Only 140 calories a serving. So they got the great taste, but it's not going to poison you. It's not going to make you feel bad. It's not going to make you gain weight. It's not going to make you barf up your toenails like Monday Night Raw does. It's only 140 calories a serving, plus keto-friendly, gluten-free, grain-free, soy-free, and low-carb. And you can build your own box. And you do not even need tools. All you need is money. Money to pay for this shit. If you don't have that, you're screwed. But you can go to magicspoon.com slash gym and use the promo code gym at checkout to build your very own custom bundle 
like cocoa and fruity and frosted and peanut butter and blueberry and cinnamon and cookies and cream and maple waffle. Boy, they, I hope they come up with some more. I'm thinking of a of a good kerosene flavor. They can make anything taste kerosene. good at Magic Spoon. Yeah, they can make anything taste good at Magic it's Spoon. Not, it's not about making it taste good. It has to be an audience that actually wants it. Who the hell wants kerosene cereal? Hey, they could burnt rubber. They could make oh, burnt on. rubber cereal, and I would eat it. because you would they're eat just, it. They're just magic. Folks, you go to <laughs> magicspoon.com, and they're just, they're a bunch of fairies sprinkling fairy dust all over everything. Just the magic it just comes, it just, it, it appears like magic. Magicspoon.com slash Jim to grab a custom bundle of this cereal made by these magicians. And be sure to use the promo code Jim at checkout to save $5 off your order. And remember, Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. If you don't like it for any reason, they will refund your money, no questions asked. Magicspoon.com slash Jim. Use the code Jim to save $5 off at checkout. It's guilt-free. It's not money-free, but we'll save you five bucks. It's magic. Have to believe it is magic. This is the best cereal I've ever stuck in my face. You know, except for Magic Spoon, I like to have fish on Fridays, Brian. Fish? Yeah, have you got any fish? I mean, <laughs> I may have a few, but I don't know about having them on Friday, having them... For dinner, I assume you mean? Yeah, you, people, if people only knew what goes on in the commercial breaks around here at the, at the gym pyre. Something very fishy is going yeah, on. Yeah, something very fishy going on. Just don't let your kids listen to this episode. I'm sure they're still alive. The, the fish, I mean, not the kids. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I guess we should go to, to NXT now before we get in too much trouble. Remember when this was the program we liked the most of all the wrestling? Because it I do remember those dark days, yes. Yeah, we got some wrestling and it made some sense. We could see some guys have some matches and well, that's all over with. Um this is embarrassing. And I just I'm I'm going to to try to enumerate some of the things that we saw just to warn people that if you were thinking about watching NXT Record it, find Steiner, and then burn the recording afterwards. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Beyond the main event scene right now, which has Ziggler and Rude and Champa and, of course, Rex Steiner, beyond that, the rest of the program, don't you think Dave McClain should sue? Yes. Tell me, is there any wrestling show ever that has been as influenced by Glow as this appears to have been? <laughs> this is a parody wrestling show. It's it's not really to be taken in any way seriously as even re modern wrestling. This is a parody of modern wrestling. They're mad because the audience for NXT that they had was too old. Too old for the demo. We all know what those demo people do when they stay up late on Wednesday nights. But <laughs> that's the reason for it was because it was the only program that people who have grown up with and seen real professional wrestling could stomach to watch to get their wrestling fix. It wasn't perfect. It wasn't even great, but it was okay if you were a wrestling fan, whereas the other shows are not. So they... <laughs> Fix that. They made sure that no wrestling fan would ever want to watch this program again. It's insulting. It's insulting to people in the business. And it's not the talent's fault. They're doing what some idiot's telling them to do. It's just the fucking idiot that's... The loose nut behind the wheel is the cause of the car crash, not a bad motor. The first match on this program was the Dusty Classic Women's Tag Team Tournament Cora Jade and Glamour Girl Gonzalez, Raquel Gonzalez, who had a cool kind of badass look like the big female diesel bodyguard type of thing, is now soft and feminine. And they wrestled the odd couple team of Wendy Chu and Dakota Kai. Did you watch any of this match, Brian? I did, actually. And I had to see finally Wendy Chu in action after hearing yeah. you talk about her. But also, I was shocked because I had it on mute, because I hate the commentary, I didn't realize it was Dakota Kai until, like, in the middle of the match, I saw her face. 
from the looks of her, from the hair in the back, I thought it was a different person. You used to like her, didn't you? I thought she was good. She was good as a baby face and good as a heel, yeah. Still feel that way after seeing this match? <laughs> I don't know if she's just embraced the 2.0 philosophy or what this is, but uh, I'm just glad that these two, who obviously are trying really hard, will be there to represent Dusty Rhodes in the finals of the Dusty Classic. Well, and now let's mention, I think we've missed the obvious. Everybody's wondering, how is Cody Rhodes going to debut? Is Cody Rhodes going to debut? What's Cody Rhodes going to do in the WWE? But the fucking answer's been right here in front of their, our faces. He's, he's going to hit the ring in NXT and defend Dusty's honor. He's going to beat up everybody in this Dusty Classic Tag Team Tournament and, and say, stop bandying my father's name around with this tomfoolery. They should just turn NXT over to Cody. I would watch it every week. Cora Jade started with Wendy Chu in this match. Cora Jade looks like she's 12 years old. and She carries a skateboard around, just so you'll know. And Wendy Chu, of course, as we know, wrestles in pink, furry, full-body pajamas and furry bunny slippers. And they did a spot where Chu did a drop down and Jade jumped over. And by the time Jade come back off the other side, Wendy Chu had gone to sleep because that's her gimmick. So Cora Jade tiptoes in the ring past the sleeping Wendy Chu to tag Raquel Gonzalez and says, shh, See, everybody, shh. It's like wrestling in a library now. Everybody's got to be quiet. Raquel Gonzalez comes in and tiptoes over to the sleeping bunny and tries to drop an elbow and Wendy Chews, Wendy Chews, Wendy Chu moves, or she chewed and then she moved at the last second, and I moved too. I fast forwarded. I'm not, drop. how do you call that? One tackle, drop down, go to sleep? Fuck. So this is just embarrassing. Then, did you have any other comments on this contest? This is modern wrestling. Every promotion needs a mascot, unfortunately. Well, they got one now. So next was the, remember the Creed brothers, Julius and Brutus Creed, as they're brothers, they're shooters, they're greener than chlorophyll. They got something, but it's a long way off. Well, they go to the parking lot, <laughs> and there is the Creed brothers in the parking lot, surrounded and covered up by crowbars and lead pipes or whatever that they've been beaten with, and they're selling like they're doing backstrokes on dry land. Did you see that? Oh, yes, I saw that, and all the wonderful people that ran out there to save them, including Roddy Strong just running around in the background for some reason. And they still were doing a backstroke on dry land. That was their selling the vicious attack that we didn't see by the people that we didn't know, but they left all the implements that they used laying on top of the victims. Next match was Tiffany Stratton versus Don Henley's daughter, Fallon. Fallon Henley. The next match... No, <laughs> actually, it wasn't a match. It was a package. On Andre Chase and Chase University, he's in his Letterman sweater, he's giving a lecture to whoever the fuck, and this, I wrote, is the absolute worst of 1990s Vince McMahon. He didn't learn from Dean Douglas. Then, did you see Carmelo and Trick at the barbershop? Of course. Now, I've got to admit that I fast-forwarded through this because I thought it was a commercial for a movie or something, and I was trying to find the next NXT programming, and then I realized, wait a minute, I recognize one of those guys, and I backed it up, and it was Carmelo Hayes and his friend Trick at the barbershop with a bunch of unidentified guys. Nobody was getting their hair cut, but everybody was bullshitting like they do it, the, do guys bullshit at the barbershop these days like they used to back in the days of Mayberry, North Carolina and Floyd the Barber? I'm sure that they do, yes, of course. How would that happen? I haven't gotten a, a professional haircut in two years now, two years last month, as a matter of fact. 
But previously, before that, for the previous 45 years, I got a haircut about once a month. And whether it's great clips or whether it's sports clips or whether it's a clip joint of any kind, I've gone in, I've put my name in, I've had my name called, I've been set in a fucking chair, and I've had some nice woman with varying degrees of talent cut my fucking hair. I have never once brought six to eight friends along with me so that I could talk to them instead of getting my hair cut. It happens. I, I don't do it either. I've never brought a friend to a haircut, but it happens. Well, this was long and boring, and they talked about a ladder match at WrestleMania. Something new, finally, that we've never seen before. A multi-man ladder match. <clears throat> All righty. Ah, now we come to the part of the program I know you watched, Brian. Lashing out with Lash Legend. It's a talk show. And I thought that actually Lash Legend was indeed Wendy Williams, just under a presumed name, but I've now I've heard that Win Wendy Williams has bad health, so Lash Legend must be trying to audition to take over her show. Oh, I don't know. She seemed like the second coming of Dick Cavett when I was watching. Oh, well, Dick Cavett wouldn't have come the first time with this programming, I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, he would have stayed home. He would never have come to this program. It was a fake talk show with a Wendy Williams wannabe doing scripted lines in front of a fake audience who were obviously getting cues at every time that Lash Legend or her guest, the lioness Nikita Lyons, every time they said something, the fake audience would do fake, ooh, like they do in the audience of all these fucking goofy talk shows that bored housewives with nothing to do all day that aren't getting any dick at night sit and watch and it was fucking embarrassing and i don't know why that it, it, certainly they didn't just book lash legend to do a talk show having never heard her speak or not even trying to run one of these up the flagpole see if anybody saluted it so I can only assume that some of these comedy writers in this company think that this woman is doing a good job at this. This was fucking rotten. It is. It, I know the overall theme is the F word that you're never supposed to use in wrestling, fake. And I never used that word. I fought people who used that word to apply to my business, professional wrestling. But whatever this is, this is fucking fake. And it deserves to be called that. They didn't mean anything they said, and they didn't deliver it well to boot. There's no acting here. Nikita Lyons may be a fighter and a martial artist and a, a belly dancer and, and a fucking, you know, dog whisperer. I don't know what all her talents are. But she can't act and neither can Lash. And it didn't do either one of these girls any good. And then they got face-to-face -face standing up, and Lash Legend said Nikita Lyons had boob implants in her ass, I think is what she said. And the fake security freaked out and made funny faces. What do you think? You liked it. Tell the truth. No, you, I did you, not like it. You know, you love bad shit like this. The worse it gets, the better it is for you. I do like bad stuff, although this was not the good type of bad. <laughs> it was the first time I've seen Lash Legend after all the weeks of you talking about her. So I had to see what this was, and they bring out Nikita. Nikita made her debut a couple of weeks ago, impressed, I don't want to say everyone, but a lot of people. A lot of people talking about her. Great looking girl. I then, in the week since then, see videos people have been sending me. Apparently, she's a musician. She has music videos. She has songs. It's like, oh, wow, this is a talented person. I wonder what they're going to do to capitalize on the fact that she could <laughs> sing and she does martial arts and all of this. And this is what they did. They put her out there in a horrible segment <laughs> let's, that people let's laughed at. Let's figure out the one thing she can't do and make her do that. That'll show her. 
This was so fake, excuse me, Jim, but this was fake. And this was bad. It was stuff like this, the girl sleeping in the ring. That's what made me think, watching this, this is GLOW. I'm watching modern GLOW wrestling, and that's NXT. Yep. Yeah, you are, Lance. Well, let's move along, shall we? The next match, a last man standing match. L.A. Knight versus Grayson Waller. Again, I like L.A. Knight. He can work. He's a classic style wrestler. He can talk his ass off. He's got a line of bullshit a mile long. He's in good shape, looks like an athlete. Everything they do with him is rotten. Either he's getting beat like a drum, like a like a dusty rug, or he's involved in some fucking this last man standing match. Oh, and by the way, now they've got a thing on NXT where like the other programs, they they get the match, the entrances, then they go to a break. On the other side of the break, they have a promo in the back from completely unrelated people. Well, you know that the match is standing in the ring, but you got to watch this before you can see the match. And that was Briggs and Stratton, the Lucha Suits, and Carmen Electra doing some more fake shit. And uh, old Stratton there is still letting everybody know that he hadn't got laid yet, but he's working on it. Fuck me. Then they come back to the match. I mentioned last man standing. No DQ, lazy booking. They jump-started it in the aisleway. They fought on the floor. They got a garbage can out. And this just before the break. They come back from the break. They're fighting in the crow's nest, high above the fucking arena on this little tower thing. And L.A. Knight nails Grayson Waller, and he takes a bump off of the top of the tower, but just kind of a shitty, like I'm falling and off camera. And it's not in the view of the people in the arena. It just falls behind the tower. So LA Knight does like the <laughs> done with him and walks back to the ring. And here comes Grayson Waller's big stooge in the suit, carrying him like a damsel in distress, like King Kong holding Fay Ray, like he caught him coming down off the fucking tower, carries him back to the ring. So then the stooge stops L.A. Knight, and as they're about to, uh, I mean, already they fought in the back, and the guy did, took a death-defying bump, and they've got the garbage cans out, and they've got the chairs or whatever. They've got handcuffs. Actually, look more like leg irons. And they're about to handcuff L.A. Knight or leg iron L.A. Knight to the ropes or the post or something, when they break in with an audio report from Mackenzie Mitchell in the back, yeah, the creeds are hurt and they can't wrestle tonight. Well, they can't wrestle any fucking night, but is that the place to give us that news when they're about to, <laughs> they're about to chain a man to a ring post, do who knows what to it, but that's the time we got to get this important update about the guys that got fake jumped in the parking lot an hour beforehand. So they got that in. Somehow, L.A. Knight turns the tables and cuffs the stooge to the ring post and then beats up Grayson Waller and throw, picks him up and throws him bodily over the top rope and he lands on a table on the floor and goes through the table to the floor. That's not the finish. Because then he puts Grayson Waller in a garbage can and hits the garbage can five times with a chair then takes the chair and hits the handcuffed stooge four times, then clears off the announcer's desk. Why are you clearing it off? Don't want the guy to get bruised when he lands on the exactly. corner of the monitor? That's right. You know, it, at least there used to be a reason. The guys would, and, and it was told on TV, the guys would clear the monitors off because, hey, the guys don't want to pay for this expensive television equipment. They're clearing off the, the breakable electronics. That was actually a shoot. I always thought the easy out was have the commentators move them. Oh my God, my producer's yelling at me in my headset. Let me get this. There you go. I've, I've done that a time or two, but that's that requires quick thinking and forethought. So he clears off the announcer's desk, but Grayson Waller hits L.A. Knight with a blackjack. 
But it wasn't even a sock with a toilet paper roll in it. It was something that they made to look like a legitimate gangster's blackjack, and therefore you can't, you couldn't really see the shot, and it wasn't really very picturesque. And he put L.A. Knight on the table. Then he climbs all the way to the top rope, and L.A. Knight is kind enough to lay there on the table and not move. And Grayson Waller does an elbow off the top rope, out onto the fucking desk, and they go through the desk, and Grayson Waller wins. So L.A. Knight gets beat again. <sighs> Glad I never see any matches with all these tables and chairs and things, because it would, it would get old quick if you did. But fortunately, that's never done. L.A. Knight's really impressive, but I don't know what this match was. And then when the guy fell off, and then the other guy caught him and carried him to the oh. ring... I said, why am I watching this? What has happened to NXT? <laughs> is this Shawn Michaels, the booker? What is this? I think Shawn Michaels is doing what they're telling him to do as best he can. I don't know why he would book anything like this. He never, he was a jack off in his day, but he didn't just completely just ass off with everything. It was just him assing off with people he didn't like. The Tony D'Angelo gimmick is even more 1990s Vince McMahon than Andre Chase. I mean, you've got all the classics in it. You got the, you got Joe Pesci, you got Scott Hall, Razor Ramon, the wise guys, you got Angelo Savoldi, Angelo Savoldi. They ought to have Tony D'Angelo stand out front of, uh, like, I don't know, little Italy in Baltimore, take him to Baltimore, put him out in front of Sabatino's. He's the, he's the maitre d', but he, he does numbers on the side. Another Dusty Classic match. Kaylee Ray and Io Shirai against Katten Zaro and Carter. And, by the way, the Toxic Attraction girls are watching all of these matches because they're the tag team champions, so they're going to face the winner of this tournament, and they're in the back in their lounge area where apparently they lounge with male strippers with the shirtless with the bow ties on and they're serving the the wine and the champagne and everything but now in this segment their male strippers have been attacked and beaten up <laughs> and replaced by I, the wrestlers i guess i don't know who the fuck they were but they were dressed up in the male strippers male stripper outfits and they've taken over but they never did anything. They just wanted to be around toxic attraction. Cora Jade and Mandy Rose had a fake fight in the back, and a bunch of the strippers, the male strippers, separated them. And then Indy Hartwell and her partner, who the fuck? What's her name? The Persian Gulf? I don't remember. Persia. Her name's Persia. Oh. Persia, 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 Persia Parada. Indy and Persia are continuing to have issues having this fake argument about their fake boyfriend. And they're not happy. Nor grumpy, sleepy, doc, dopey, or any of them. Tiffany Stratton is an 80s valley girl 40 years too late. And I'm sure Vince remembered, ooh, grody to the max. In 1983, I was calling Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson Muffy and Sissy. The Valley Girls. The Valley Girls. The tag team championship of NXT was on the line. MSK taking on Marcel Marceau and Fabian Forte, the other two members of Imperium, not named Walter slash Gunter. Imperium are great wrestlers. They don't have a standout look or any discernible personality. They're two bald-headed guys that, by the nature of the gimmick that they've been given, are told to be fairly colorless because they're the military-type stooges of Vunt, Walter or Wunter or Galter. Walter Gunter, Gunter Walter. It's Walter Gunter, Gunter Walter. <laughs> MSK look and wrestle like indie outlaw goofs. So they had a match, and at the climactic point, the injured Creed brothers came in and suplexed and beat up everybody in the match while still trying to sell their 
injuries from the fake attack earlier while they had three strips of black trainer's tape on each one of them that looked ridiculous. And did you see them? They come in, they beat everybody up, and they're still holding their injured arm next to each other after they beat everybody up. They're great at selling. <laughs> Couldn't sell pussy on a troop train. Then, I, this was really bad, because John Wayne Gacy and his cohort Harlan Sanders, the tattooed guy that doesn't speak, were in the back doing another fake promo with two guys named Draco and Quinn. And did you hear Gacy? He's really hamming it up. He thinks he's a fucking Golden Globe winning actor. Or did you listen? I don't think yeah. I took this off mute because I don't remember what he sounded like or what he said. Well, there you go. And guess who's coming to a kid to a kid. Guess who's coming to NXT. A kid. A, a kid. I thought they had 25 of them already. But they got more now. A kid is coming to NXT. What is a kid? Why is he the kid of A? What is it about? I, I've heard of the Colorado kid. I've heard of the Rawhide kid. I, You know, but what's the A kid? I don't know. I don't think I've seen a, him before. Maybe he's the offspring of the A team. But wait, there's a new winner of the fakest promo ever done, Kushida and the Goof with the Jacket. Not only was this fake, but it, it was the double whammy. It was the most racist promo ever also. Is there a group of people that look out for Japanese Americans' rights? Of course. Is, how does this fly on national television? When they have these guys go out and talk like the worst racist uh, guys and girls, racist, stereotypical, <laughs> Hop Singh looks like a goddamn astrophysicist next to any oriental personality on WWE television. I can't add anything to that. I didn't watch the promo with them. I didn't care. Well, we got to the part that we were desperately trying to get to for the NXT title. It's a three-way, but we like all three of them. Champa and Dolph Ziggler and Breaksteiner. And this is what I wanted to see all along. I don't want to miss Steiner. Champa and, and Ziggler have been fantastic, but we've just described the rest of this program. And guess what time the bell rang to start this match? Eight minutes till 10 Eastern. Even with an overrun, they were going to have under 15 minutes to get in and get out with breaks. I'm like, all right. They started out fast, and it's a three-way, so you can't really say that the match makes a ton of sense, but Steiner stayed with it. Except there was one fucking hilarious bobble that reminded me of his dad. And otherwise, you know, the kid, he's been, he said, has he had 20 matches now? And he's in there with Ziggler, who's a 20-year veteran, and Champa, who's almost and is fucking impeccable, and he don't look out of place. And did you, the, the double vertical suplex, did you see that? I've I've seen... People kind of do a half-assed version of that before, but I've never seen one guy just stand up under both guys and just take them. And poor Dolph almost went a little bit too quick, but it's not supposed to look pretty when something like that. Then, at one point, actually, Ziggler and Champa got a spot slightly crossed. They did something. I can't remember what it was. It didn't make a lot of sense. And Steiner just came in and leveled Ziggler with a clothesline, so he actually saved him. And then it went to the break. There's no story in this, but everybody was serious, and the shit looked good, and they were taking time to sell most of it. And then, did you see the one part where... Poor old Steiner got ahead of himself, and it was fucking hilarious, and yeah. all I could do was think of his dad. I thought you were going to talk about this before when you said that he got started too early, but yeah. Well, yeah, you know, 
So it was after the break. Champa picks Ziggler up for a power bomb. And as he's got him up for the power bomb, suddenly because Steiner has been down, but suddenly you see Steiner jump up and dive head first straight past Champa and Ziggler and land on his face and then just roll out on the other side of the ring selling. <laughs> I'm like, what in the French fried titty fuck did he just do? And then I realized, aha, the aha moment came. Champa had power bombed Ziggler on that after Steiner did the drive by. And then Champa went for his pedigree. What is the fairy tale ending thing or whatever? And Steiner speared him. Steiner saw the power bomb, thought it was the pedigree, goes to fucking spear Champa like he thinks he's supposed to, it realizes in midair and just dives right past him and just says, fuck it, I'll just roll out. I can see Rick Steiner in so in the bumps that that this guy takes, and in just the Steiner didn't make a lot of mistakes when he was uh, starting either, but when he did, it was spectacular and hilarious, and you laughed about it afterwards. And then he'd come back and just mow everybody down and make up for it. And then finally, Steiner hit his finish on Ziggler, but Rude pulled his leg. No, he pulled his ass out of his pants. No, no, that was that was that was next. Oh, oh. Remember he pulled the leg first on the uh on the finish that he hit. And then that gave Champa the chance to hit the widow's bell and the fairy tale ending, got a big two count. Ziggler was able to make save in the nick of time. And then Champa's shit canned Ziggler. And Steiner had taken the widow's bell and the fairy tale ending, and he's getting up. And as Champa goes for the running knee, that's when Rude reached in and was going to pull Steiner out and Champa would hit the buckle instead as he charged past there's nobody there. The only thing that Rude could grab was the, the ass of the back waistband of Steiner's tights. And when he pulled, <laughs> the full moon came out over Florida. He almost pantsed him. His whole ass came out. But the funny part was, again, it reminds me of Rick Steiner when he pulled Steiner out, he just went backwards, head first down to the mat or to the ground outside, upside down in one of those crazy bumps that Steiner used to, Rick Steiner used to take when he was the same age as his son because they were almost indestructible and, and it didn't hurt him. It looked dangerous. That's how Rick Steiner got over is his shit looked so real because he worked completely differently from anybody else and on offense he was so powerful you bought it and on defense the bumps were so unorthodox and looked like it should hurt you that you can and, and and his son's doing the same thing so anyway rude snatches steiner out where champa runs into the turnbuckles and then ziggler hits the super kick on champa one two three what a fucking finish and it was boom 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 just like that shit was happening Everybody was in place, and now Ziggler is the new NXT champion, but Steiner has still never been defeated. So th this, that's well worth watching. But the rest of it is a schlog to get there. What do you think of the, the main of the only event on this program? Great action. It's sad that it took a move to NXT to get some great work out of Dolph Ziggler. Not that he isn't always good, but seems to be really into what he's doing, and how can he not be? He's actually getting a push somewhere. These four guys are great. I mean, it's kind of like the problems we say about AEW. You have the tone of a Punk and an MJF, and then the rest of the show. You have the tone of these main eventers, and then there's the rest of the show that they fill up the card with. It doesn't make it so that you want to stay to see these guys. I'm glad Champa's still in the main event mix. I'm surprised that he's still there, but they're using him well. He's, on, he's been on Raw, too. And we'll see what happens. They got the belt off Steiner or Braun Breaker. What do they do now? Well, I mean, I can see where they're going in that Ziggler and Root are the two best guys on the Raw roster to train and or give in-ring experience to younger guys, more inexperienced guys. Champa doesn't need it, but Steiner does to, to work with guys like that. It'll just get him better that much quicker. 
So those are the two perfect guys to do it, but it would have been nice if they'd have recognized their legitimate talent a while back and and not uh, had them floating around where, oh, yeah, we'll just send them over to NXT. They don't get five minutes on Raw anyway. But they've, they've got to have, they got to feature people in their pajamas rather than Rudin and Ziggler. Speaking of featuring people in their pajamas, are you going to fucking turn in early tonight to get ready for another big day at the Arcadian Vanguard Network or what's going on over there on your side of the world? I can't state what time I'll be turning it in tonight, but I doubt I'll be switching into pajamas. I'm ready for action at all times. And of course, you can be ready for action too on the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. Get information on Twitter <laughs> at Super Podcast or on Facebook, facebook.com slash Arcadian Vanguard. And God damn it, you had to make me laugh right when I'm doing my plugs. But let me tell you about some of the fun things happening this week. Of course. Whoa, was that a different one or was that the old one? That's a different one. It's extended. Play the old one. Do you still have the old one? I Wait a minute. I, ha- I have the short scream. No, wait, no, I'm not sorry. That. Hold on. Not that. Hold on, wait a minute. Oh, wait, that's the wrong one, too. There it was. So you got... Or you got... <laughs> All right, well, this poor woman is obviously not listening to Fine Wrestling Podcast, and you can listen to them this week. This week on Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon, Brian's guest, Jeff Walton. Here, what longtime Los Angeles wrestling personality Jeff Walton has to say about a number of things. Fred Blassie, Andre the Giant, the Olympic Auditorium, and so much more. A fun, fun wrestling history talk. Check it out today at suawpod.com or search for Shut Up and Wrestle with Brian Solomon wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Also want to make mention of the latest episode of Breaking Kayfabe with Bowdrin and Barry, where the boys talk with Glacier. Blood runs cold, but you can hear it today. Hot and bothered, or cold like Glacier, at baldrinpod.com. Wet and dry, itchy and irritated, whatever it may be. Or look for Breaking Cafe with Baldrin and Barry wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And of course, the 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership! Oh, boy. That one got me. That, that's the way my throat feels right now. Like Steve Austin breaking right through the glass. Go through the archive today. I really heard my voice. Go through the archive today at 605pod.com. They announced baseball is back, so get ready. Opening day Star Wars coming at you in a few weeks, but 605 Super Podcast, The Mothership. Baseball been very, very good to you. Yes, I love baseball. It's very good to me. Well, the time has come for our final review of the episode or of the the show here today is the episode of AEW from March 9th, the Wednesday Night Dynamite. (sighs) It made a lot of news that they reunited the Hardy, not the Hardly Boys, but the actual real Hardy Boys. (sighs) And now that's been done. And can't ever be taken back and done right. Remember when the Rock and Roll Express ran in on you guys in Mid-South, but they started dancing midway through the run? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> well I, I remember actually when they got the Rock and Roll Express back after several years of being apart and promptly put them in a fucking angle with the Cruel Connection. <laughs> there you go. Um, all right, the start of the program, Jericho and Eddie Kingston. And you got to hand it to Chris Jericho. He's actually made the effort to cut to carbs and lose some weight. He's slimmed down. He not only slimmed down, but he also, some way or another, I guess he had all the the gray hair shaved off and, and brown hair grew in in its place. But his hair's brown. He's lost weight. But he's dressing like a biker on one of those reality shows about the Hells Angels if it was sponsored by Just For Men Hair Dye. He's a, he's a biker with a midlife crisis. Folks, we can all identify with that. So Jericho is doing the promo that's saying Eddie Kingston brought the old Chris Jericho out. See how these... 
It's like the same show, but a different take on a classic recipe on the different networks. Kingston brought the old Jericho out, and Jericho's ashamed that he didn't realize it and shake his hand, and he seemed contrite about the whole issue and called Kingston out. And Eddie came out, and with Kingston, eh, he's one of these guys that you can't really recap his promo, and you can't even really summarize it verbally it, 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 it when he does them you get what he's saying but it wouldn't make any sense if it was just written down but it's it's the way he says things the inflection the the context you kind of get it and he's natural and he laid it all out and he's coming up with his shit off the top of his head you can tell in a lot of cases he's lost all the big ones but finally he gets this when some asshole in the crowd what at him <laughs> And he's like, hey, shut up. Austin ain't here. Fuck you, right? <laughs> Give me some respect. <laughs> and people laughed at the guy heckling him, and he went right back to it. And Kingston basically wanted to make his fans proud for all his, the big ones he's lost and his life where he's never come out on top, and finally he won the big one, and he made the people proud. And then Jericho said, you were right. I respect you. And he offered Kingston his hand. And suddenly we hear music. We don't know what the fucking music is. And then we see, here comes. I am not making this up, ladies and gentlemen. To hit the ring on Chris Jericho and Eddie Kingston, here comes Daniel Garcia and 2.0. They're everywhere. Check your home movies, folks. When you were a kid, get the projector out. Fucking pull the screen down, put a sheet up on the wall, whatever. Watch your home movies when you were three years old. I guarantee you 2.0 and Garcia are in the film. So immediately three job guys overpower two top stars. But if you notice Jericho goes down, nobody noticed this except me. But Jericho goes down and sells, and they don't do anything to him. They don't really hit him. They just throw him down, and he he collapses. He takes the dive, and then he lays there selling. Every once in a while, somebody will come over and put a knee on him, but they won't do anything to him. It's dramatic foreshadowing, apparently. Because it doesn't make sense, even though a lot of these swerves don't make sense anyway. It really doesn't make sense when the guys that you're about to help are kicking the shit out of you with a goddamn pocket knife and a fucking popeel pocket fisherman. So now Jericho's down, Kingston down. Here comes Santana and Ortiz. They make the save. They grab Garcia. They give Jericho the bat. They're holding Garcia. And shades, as JR would say, of Christmas night, 1994, in the Knoxville Civic Coliseum, when there, when there, I say, are the gangsters holding Ricky Morton out, and I've got the racket, and what did I do? I turned around and whopped the gangsters. Well, Jericho turns around and whops Santana and Ortiz with the baseball bat. I told you he was turning heel, like we couldn't see that coming a mile away. But he hit Santana. Santana saw it coming and wasn't really anxious to be there to receive it and kind of turned and he hit Santana on his right bicep. And then he gave Ortiz a gut shot and that one was okay. Then he proceeded to take a baseball bat <laughs> and hit Ortiz four more times, Santana five more times, and then back to Ortiz for, I think, three or four more. This looked ridiculous. If you have hit two other grown men a total of 13 times with a baseball bat and they either one are still alive, you're a piece of shit. So now Jericho's going crazy with the bat. All the shots look fake, but. He's going crazy with it. Here comes old Hager, who looks conflicted, along with the other 
dumb blase looks he has on his face all the time. <laughs> and then he potatoes Ortiz with a shit clothesline. And at that point, I, was it? No, Jericho still has the bat. Jericho hits Kingston five more times with the baseball bat. And they're getting a close up so you can tell that he's pulling them. I've used a bat, Louisville Slugger, part of the gimmick. I've booked guys to use bats. Bob Armstrong, walking tall, carried a big stick. Generally, one shot with the bat to each person gets the point across. Any more than that, and people have time to start picking out that it looks fake. But Jericho hits five more times on Kingston. They do some more shit, and then Jericho is backing up. And Hager's behind him on his knees yelling at one of the other fucking baby faces. And Jericho backs up and trips over Hager's leg and almost fell and recovered by holding himself up in the turnbuckles and then got mad and started waving the bat around like he meant to do it. And this went forever. And there were no referees. There was no security. There were no cops. There were no other people coming in to help. There was no bell ringing. Just this fake attack on and on and on and then finally they get Hager on the apron with Kingston and Hager goes to pick him up for a power bomb did you see this part of course I saw this part he almost killed him yeah okay well here's the thing when he goes to pick Kingston up Kingston first he went to just pick Eddie up without Eddie pushing off and he couldn't Okay, and, and Eddie was it had not got ready for it, so then Eddie pushes off. And when you take a power bomb, you not only have to push off, but once that you're the guy stands you straight up, you have to do a sit up. The guy's holding you upside down. You have to do a sit up so you get all the way up, so that you don't go back down head first. Well, Eddie did the sit up. But Hager didn't realize on the apron he can't lean back like he normally does to draw a gap without losing his balance, so he lost his balance and almost dropped Eddie head first. And then some of the guys in the ring grabbed Hager so he wouldn't fall off the apron. And they they held on to him, and Hager muscled Eddie up and then power bombed him off the apron toward a table that was sitting on the floor, but he didn't drop him flat like for a power bomb. He sent him back of the head first, head first, straight down through that table to the floor. And it could have broke his fucking neck. And then Jericho's line, this is the Jericho Appreciation Society, and that's entertainment. Well, this may be the Jericho Appreciation Society, but that was an entertainment and there's the trademark sports entertainer, but it's false advertising. This was highly rotten except for Eddie Kingston. Your thoughts. Well, I'll start with Eddie Kingston, who I've been high on for a while. I've been high on him since I saw him in ring of honor. When you asked me to come to shows, you've been high since eight 30 this morning, but that's a different story for another time. Six 30 this morning, if you want to be accurate, but you know what? And I think his biggest problem isn't physique, and everyone always points to physique. I think right now, sadly, it's age, just because he's getting his chance now. But hopefully he can go for a while. But he is the modern-day version of the American dream. Comes out there, speaks in a natural way. People connect to him naturally, because he's just being himself. Or being yeah. an extension of himself. And he feels like the average person. Now, Dusty, after a while, the American dream's wearing a fur coat and doing all sorts of shit. I don't think we're going to see Eddie Kingston doing that. But you know what? Even then, Dusty looked like a fucking ditch-digging son of a plumber that fell into money. But even like Dallas Page, and I'm not the biggest Dallas Page fan, but he had a great run in WCW, and it was made by the fans. The fans started getting behind him. And he was an older guy, and it was the case of a guy who didn't traditionally look like what a wrestling star would be. I think Eddie Kingston's kind of that guy for today, and I'm glad he's being appreciated by fans, and I'm, his work's just been great. The match with Jericho has been great. We've been putting over Jericho. Jericho came out there. I swear, if you took Stan Lane's wig ha, ha. And, and put some extensions on it, that's what he had on his head. I don't know what was going on. You said they just dyed his hair. I don't know what was going on with his hair. But it was definitely different because it was stood out. I was like, what the hell is going on there? 
Stan Lane's wig, ladies and gentlemen, look it up. But I think it was really good to a point. And then it just went overboard. As soon as they went for the table, I cringed. Because you see it all the time now. It has no importance. When they almost dropped him on his head, I cringed. And then when they dropped him on his head, I, I cringed yeah. again. Because you saw it coming. It was so unnecessary. It went on for a while. I'm okay with the concept of Jericho with 2.0 and Daniel Garcia as heels. Let's see if, if Daniel Garcia has anything right now. We're, we're about to find out by hook or by crook. He's been on that show kind of aimless, just running in. I didn't even know he had music until this week. Just running in at various times, attacking people for no reason to set up a match that suddenly happens two days later. We never get to see Hobbs wrestle. No. We never get to see FTR wrestle. Briscoes, they're not even in the, in the company. We There are tons of people that we want to see more of that have a chance to... Even if Daniel Garcia and 2.0 are the second comings of Carl Gotch, for fuck's sake, they've been beaten consistently to where even if they are good, they don't mean anything now. And Daniel Garcia is a good athlete. He's got the fucking charisma of cabbage. And he's young, and he needs to grow up and get some personality. And the other guys have personality, and they're the epitome of a job team because since we've seen them, all they do is get beaten matches and then run in and beat people up and then have a match with them and get beat. Well, look, Jericho's really good at getting younger guys over. So maybe, ah! so maybe this will go wait, really hold well. Hold on. Wait. <laughs> what, are you, what are you saying? Where's my goddamn it's the new one? No, that's the wrong one. No, that's the extended one. Hold on. There we go. I laugh at your remark. I was, when Hager ran in there, my hope was, oh, this is it. Jericho's going to finally turn on Hager. That's the end of Hager. Because he'll get the match with Jericho. Jericho will win because he's the new heel Jericho. And now it'll be him and these other guys. It'll be just four of them. They get feud with Santana, Ortiz, and Kingston, and whoever else. But no, then Hager's now with him again. <laughs> <laughs> the dead weight of Jericho just keeps following him around. Yeah, it, it went too long and it got ridiculous, but there were redeeming values and certain things. And the idea of Santana Ortiz being on their own and Kingston continuing to have a push. The problem is Jericho, like even with the early days of AEW, Jericho has the genesis of a good idea in his best moments. And if there's no one there, and I don't think Tony Khan's the person, if there's no one there to stop him from going full, <laughs> full blast wherever he wants to go. Or if there's no one there to say, hold on, let's draw this out, he's just going to flush your head down the toilet the first night. There you have it. What do you do for the next segment? Get a bigger toilet. <laughs> um, explain to me how that Dante Martin suddenly got a World Heavyweight Championship match. Because that was the next match for the world title out of nowhere. Adam Page versus Dante Martin. I, I wrote questions. How the fuck did Dante Martin just get a title match? How often did Ric Flair defend the world title against Sam Houston? There are two baby faces here. Why does Tony Khan want to create a situation where people in the arena are cheering for his baby face champion's opponent, especially when his baby face champion is the weakest major company world champion in years because of the incompetent booking that he's gone through? They are booking the world champion now to get wins on television after he's won the world title because he needs wins on TV because he never had any before. Two guys who can do all kinds of athletic stuff but put so much effort into their big moves and their flips that everything in between either looks like the amateur hour or doesn't make any sense. And again, Dante Martin, great athlete, tremendously green, needs to grow up, needs some kind of look and personality, scared of his own shadow. Expose him in small doses and highlight his athleticism. Adam Page, completely not over, except with their base audience, which everything, including crotch rot, is over with their base audience. Tony Khan says, crotch rot, I'm for it. 950,000 AEW fans go, yeah, give me some crotch rot. 
But everybody else in the world's like, I don't I need to think about that. Is this appealing, crotch rot? So eh, now they're trying to give the world champion wins on television to make him seem like a world champion. But he, they're putting him in matches against other baby faces where there actually was a dueling chant. And all respect to Dante Martin, but if he's in the ring with the babyface world champion and it ain't 90-10 in favor of Paige, you've fucked up somehow. They did a pretty ridiculous gymnastics routine ending in a buckshot lariat 1-2-3. Do you see the same thing I saw? Yeah, I saw... A world title match out of nowhere for Dante Martin. I was surprised he was just back with his brother in a tag team. I think last week. <laughs> was it? I was like, did his brother get hurt again? What happened? No. Nope. Well, they no, said, they covered it in the promo. Yeah, they said he's fine and he's just getting a world title match. And I've been underwhelmed with Adam Page, but beyond Adam Page, who I think is athletically really good and I've liked some of his matches, he's part of the Bucks booking camp and all this stuff is tainted with the worst melodrama in the world. Well, that wasn't the end of, of things. They, Tony Schiavone got in the ring. He was all over the place on this show. He's in the ring. He's in the back again. But Paige gets in the ring, or Tony gets in the ring with Paige. Paige calls Dante back in the ring and calls Dante Martin, who uh, all the athletic ability in the world, the one thing that he his, looks like shit, especially that he does, is throw punches. And <laughs> he's... One of the hardest hitting guys I've ever wrestled, according to Adam Page, is Dante Martin. And he puts Dante over and he talks about the team with his brother, etc. And then here comes Adam Cole out to interrupt Page. Talking tough. Bingo. He hasn't won a match since he's been there. The mascot and the champion have both beaten him. But he's talking tough, saying, Paige, you su survived by the skin of your teeth, and it was a fluke win. You got lucky. Apparently, then the mascot also got lucky. Apparently, Adam Cole just didn't very lucky. And next week, Adam Cole challenges Adam Page. I challenge you next week. Now, here's the thing. Adam Cole is saying it was a fluke win. You beat me. I'm better than you are. I'm talking tough here. I'm going to show you exactly what I'm talking about. So I challenge you, Adam Page, next week to a six-man tag team match. How does that fucking solve anything in this issue? I say I'm a better man than you, even though you beat me on a fluke. So let's have a six-man tag. Doesn't that bring in a lot more variables into this situation? A lot more of ways where things could go awry or the wheels could come off and you could get beat again and it would be another fluke. So if you're coming up with the idea of how to settle this, so Cole is going to make Adam Page's life a living hell, much like Tony Khan's booking has made ours. And <sighs> environment matters. Context matters and backstory matters. In in the NXT, previous NXT environment, the Undisputed Era ran the roost, and we looked forward to seeing everything. In this environment, with this backstory for the last six weeks or whatever, Adam Cole sounds and looks like a petulant child, and all of their credibility and or interest is gone because... This is a morass, a morass, M-O-R-A-S-S, -S, look it up, a morass, and you'll never escape. <sighs> this feels like yeah. Junior Varsity Monday Night Raw. <laughs> Let's let the high school guys, it's the high school drama class, and they're going to get to write their own material and pretend to do a Monday Night Raw like the real wrestlers. That's exactly how this feels. And boy, is Adam Cole a pussy. Hey. What's his character? What is... He comes in there with some credibility, and they immediately make him a giant pussy who whines and cries and loses. I don't know what they're doing with him. Oh, oh, and his entrance, that military uniform he had on, we thought he'd come out of a fucking Battle of the Bulge or whatever. It was a video game. It's I, a video game I character. called it. I called, called it. Called it. 
That's what they're saying on Twitter. It's a video game character from some video game. And he was at in a world title match where he's already, he's debuted in the company. He hasn't beaten anybody. He loses to the joke <laughs> pockets and then goes into his world title match that he's going to lose dressed up as a video game character. And he's the heel. I'm surprised his mother didn't restrict him to the basement and refuse to cook his Hot Pockets. But next up, <laughs> Danielson and Moxley are a tag team now, Brian, and William Regal is in their corner. So what we've been scared and afeard of has come to pass. To watch Danielson, we have to watch Moxley. That is a Faustian bargain if ever I've heard one. But in this case, their their opposition. Did you catch the the team name of their opposition, Anthony Henry and J D Drake? I did not see a team name. No, the Workhorsemen. <laughs> God damn! They called them that, <laughs> and they got a graphic and every the Workhorsemen. And I agree, J.D. Drake and Anthony Henry both look like they ought to be doing some kind of community service work on the side of the highway, possibly involving scooping up horse shit from the last parade. But these two guys got no business whatsoever using the words horse and men together and describing themselves. Drake is the fat gray-haired guy that buried Keith Lee last week, and Henry has green hair. So the balding plumber still has to come in from the parking lot, even though he's supposed to be Danielson's partner and Regal's protege. He had a separate entrance. And they just beat the job guys up here as they should have. They're, I'm not saying they should have got any offense. But right as I was about to jot down, at least Moxley kept it in the ring. <laughs> he tags Danielson, and Danielson comes in to do something for the finish, and Moxley to do something big as part of the finish runs and does a dive on Henry out on the floor and completely missed him. Not, he, it, it wasn't even a dive straight. It was a dive like dive out of the ring and corkscrew and the guy's supposedly going to catch him in his arms or whatever. But he just dove out, did a flip in the air in front of the guy and landed on the floor right in front of the fucking guy and the guy took a bump anyway. He fell three feet short and the guy just, oh, fuck it, boom, down. And Danielson in the ring actually doing something right Stomped the shit out of Drake and LaBelle locked him and got the tap out. But it, it it's almost like you've got to have some kind of fuck up with Moxley just to realize that it's still Moxley. He can't go through anything seamlessly. So they get in the ring for the interview and William Regal takes the center stage. And we love William Regal. And what a great talent. And he's a, not only a great wrestler and a great trainer, but also he has done some fantastic promos. This was not one. And he, and, and I'm, not, I'm not trying to badmouth William Regal. He even apologized for it on Twitter afterwards because he went over his time. I think it was a combination of things. He was genuinely happy to be there. And he was genuinely happy with who he's working with and he he tried to be conversational and and you know happy and smiling at the beginning and, and telling tony he broke up telling tony shivani how much he meant to him for helping regal when regal first came to this country 30 years ago and you know and he did tell a story you know since he wasn't he required by his previous employer, he sat home for a few months and checked out of the wrestling business, but he came back to watching it when Danielson mentioned him. You can tell this means a lot to Regal. It just took a while. Maybe he's out of practice. Maybe it was the emotion. Whatever the case, he spent a lot of time on the preamble and then finally got to the point and spent some time going over the point. But basically, the story is Danielson in in Regal's eyes, is the perfect wrestler. And he's trained and mentored over the years, and Moxley, since he couldn't say Moxley was the perfect wrestler with a straight face, even Regal's not that good a worker, he said Moxley is the, quote, 
sadistic person that will take things to another level. What the fuck does that mean? What can you say about Moxley? But the the problem I had with this, again, is if they were going to go in this direction, the best in-ring heel in AEW and maybe all of wrestling is Brian Danielson and William Regal, the beloved William Regal, who could win a popularity contest over the fans' mothers, just called him the perfect wrestler. Isn't that like Bobo Brazil coming out and saying, boy, the Sheik is the toughest man on earth. But I digress. I think Regal needs to get the feel of things and get back in the, in the, you know, in the, in the saddle, back in the flow of things. This was not his best and it took a while and he apologized for people having to have their time cut. But I'm glad to see William Regal there, a voice of sanity and a trainer and a, a person that everybody looks up to that maybe they'll listen to him since they don't, they got offended and buried Jr. in public when he called him out on just the stupid dives and the grouping and catching everybody, which is the most blatantly obvious thing wrong with every match they have. They got offended at that. Are they going to get offended at William Regal when he, you know, probably more diplomatically than JR does, but says the same thing. What the fuck are you people doing? This is not good. I don't know. What do you think? I agree with a lot of the comments you had about that. I was surprised how many people really loved the promo. I think people just like the genuine moments. And while it's nice and you could tell, it, like you said, it meant a lot to him, part of me thinks like, you know, this isn't the place for it. And maybe I'm wrong for thinking that, but... All of a sudden, it broke Maybe he didn't need to do everything all at the same promo. I wasn't crazy about it. I was happy to see him, but... uh, He went from crying over an old friend to talking about sadism. (laughs) It was just, it was all, it was from from one end to the other. Could have focused that a little. And we'll see where they go with this. Are they going to be in the tag team division managed by William, I'm about to say Stephen Regal, managed by William Regal? I mean, we don't know exactly what's going to happen here, but um, I really can't add too much more to your comments other than to say I agree with most of them. Hey, and here's the, we don't want Regal to be a manager, although we've seen what good it's done for Arn and Tully and Vicky Guerrero and Chavo Guerrero and Jose and all the rest of the managers that... Ay, ay, ay. Uh, We went back to the back next because the world heavyweight champion, Adam Page... <laughs> was apologizing to the dork jobbers for something that he did last week that upset them or whenever. And he apologized. I was in the wrong. You were right. So now you got the baby face world champion apologizing to job guys. But then he tells them that they can't be his partners in that six man that Cole challenged for next week because he saw jungle boy. And I swear to God, he called him dino. I saw jungle boy and dino. It's Dino, by the way. Jungle Boy and Dino out back, uh, they're my partners. Oh, okay, well, yeah, i got to do my beard and everything. Uh, just silliness. Silliness involving the world champion. Then, Wheeler, Utah, was in a single match against the bastard Pack, who was accompanied by the cool ghoul and the fear monger, Penthouse Obscuro, and... Alex Abrahantes, the evil ghoulish pope or whatever. The f- can I can I jump in here? <laughs> yes, and Danhausen was there also at ringside. Go ahead. Well, of course he was. I thought it was a one-time thing. Like, okay, we got this big grudge match. Now Penta, El Zero Mieto is now a Penta, this guy. And now me, I'm this crazy deacon or whatever the fuck he is. <laughs> but now it's every week. Now he's coming out there each week and <laughs> it's not going away. And the thing you missed, and I didn't realize it until after the fact, we talked about the debut of Redbeard. Remember last week on Friday night? Yes, They brought him out. On the pre-show for the pay-per-view, Redbeard was the one in the six-man pinned after Malachi kicked him in the face. So Wait, what? So thanks for coming, Redbeard, to quote Jim Cornette. The new monster that they introduced on TV last week that came in and beat up all the security and they made over such a big deal lost 
a pre-show match the following week by pin to the fucking heels that they're in an angle with. No, not the following week. Two days later. Two days. Oh shit! I, I okay. I say. Oh, don't be silly. A week. Uh, all right. <laughs> Uh, Dan Housen was at ringside running around with Wheeler, Utah and pack apparently pockets. Remember I said, I'd have watched that ladder match on the pay-per-view if, if they had a stretchered pockets out, but they didn't. So I did. Apparently they did. They just didn't show the stretcher on camera, but when, who was it launched him? Keith Lee, Keith Lee beeled him over the top and over the heads of everybody was going to catch him. And he landed and fucked up his shoulder. Imagine that, just because somebody throws you over the top rope to a concrete floor 20 feet away, you're injured. Um, So they just took him out of that, and he hadn't been seen since. At least maybe we'll get a break. We're on a string here. Never wanting anybody to get hurt. But do we want people to not be on our television? Twinkle toes? Check. Pockets? Check. A few more on the designated injured reserved list would make Better television. Go ahead. And what an ingrate Keith Lee is. Because the other night, Pockets was the one who ran ran out, who walked out to save him when he needed backup, and then Keith Lee throws him out, breaking his arm. Well, that's because all the baby faces are out to cut the nuts off of all of their friends behind their backs. That's why they're baby faces. That's what good people do. <laughs> Has anyone explained Danhausen? Why is he there? What does he do? What is his background? Where did he come from? Why does he wrestle? Does he not? They don't, they just say, here's Danhausen. They don't give any context for why he's there. Why anybody gives a shit. I certainly think someone needs to explain it to Jim Ross, at least. He's getting a little testy about it. too. (laughs) So then in the back of the arena were the Hardly boys Adam Cole, Bobby Fish, and Kyle O'Reilly, all of them bickering like they're on their periods, as usual, while standing there not looking at each other for the camera like they're in the WWF, and it's odd and unnatural. And of course, Cole, the the, the Hardly boys thought they were gonna, he was gonna pick them to be his partners, and they said, hey, we've told you we're not messing with Adam Page. And he said, that's okay. I wasn't picking you anyway. I'm picking Fish and O'Reilly. Oh, drama between the children. They're not going to get to play together anymore at reset. Their parents are going to be upset about this if they find out the kids are bickering. FTR was then in the back again, where they stay most of the time when they're not apparently serving as the AEW parking lot attendants. They don't get to wrestle anymore. And (sighs) Officer Barb Brady is interviewing them. Dax doesn't. And again, this was the same thing as Kevin Owens hating Texas for four to six weeks. Where did this all come from? Out of nowhere. Suddenly Dax is doing a pro. And I don't blame these guys. They're given this material and they're expected to do it. And nobody could save this shit. Dax is cutting a promo about how his family is the most important thing to him, and they're going to come back and do this and that, but our family, blah, blah, blah. And then Tully just for made a forced argument for little reason. No, it's about winning the title back instead of your family. And then Dax just <laughs> snatches Tully by the fucking lapels, like, how are you to talk about my family? This is all happening in like less than 60 seconds (laughs) on this pre-tape in the back. And then Cash says, no, no, no. Never mind. It is about family. And you're not family, Tully. You're fired. So they've had this manager for two years. And there's been no cross-up or mistake made in the matches they don't have on television because the The executive vice presidents are jealous of them and the fact that they're not as talented as FTR are, which is why you never see them on television, why they're now FTR taking independent dates on indie shows around the country so that they can work with quality teams and have good matches because they're stuck in AEW with the Lollipop Guild. I didn't make that up. That's actually true. 
they are now trying to go around the country taking independent matches against teams they want to work with because they don't get to perform in the company that they work for, and we all know why that is. So they fired Tully, and as soon as they said, you're fired, <laughs> they cut away. They cut away from that. Not even any response from Tully. Like well, They cut away and said, oh, shit, we didn't expect that. I will say I do like the consistency with Tully getting into fights on TBS for insulting wrestlers for wanting to spend time with their families. What? <laughs> this is why Ole Anderson got kicked out of the Horsemen. And now, once again, he has a problem with families. Every 30 years, something like that happens. <laughs> All right, there was an emergency meeting next. We'll pick it up a little bit here, the tempo. An emergency meeting of Matt Hardy, Andre Olio Leo, private party, the butcher and the baker, and good old Jose. And the emergency meeting is Selica Matt is trying to smooth everything out. Suddenly, Matt Hardy is talking like a normal person yeah. and a baby face. Just out of nowhere. He's not talking about taking 30% of people's money or he's not teleporting himself or he's not talking in a fucking weird accent or he's not doing any of the goofy things that he's done for the last couple of years. Suddenly, for what reason, we have no idea. He's a regular, reasonable, normal, baby-faced Matt Hardy speaking to them reasonably. So, of course, every single person... <laughs> In the entire group, including the people that he's had from the start, immediately turn on him and are following Andre Oliolio, who cannot speak any language whatsoever. <laughs> English, <laughs> Spanish, <laughs> German, Japanese, uh, 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 fucking uh, uh, Eskimo. I... They all... What? Go ahead. You have mentioned that I like some of the awful things in wrestling. I get a perverse joy out of them. Andrade on the mic has hit that level. And this week he was just ridiculous. And I started losing it. I was laughing so hard. This it's like. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell he was trying to say. But then the way he tries to enunciate it makes it so much funnier. <laughs> He's trying really hard to clearly enunciate those words that we don't understand. <laughs> He sounds like he makes the elephant man sound like James Earl Jones. <laughs> oh, I'm not an animal. Oh, I'm a human being. So they all jump. There's one, two, three, four, five, or six guys jump Matt Hardy, and they're kicking the shit out of him. They hold out and their thumbs for like two minutes. Yeah, they held their he turns around to see. Gave it. Matt the thumbs up when he was looking at him, and then he turns his back and they give him the thumbs down and they hold their arms there like they're petrified. But did you love it how when there's six guys beating the shit out of Matt Hardy and music plays, and here comes Darby <laughs> Allen and Sting, and they are walking slowly, <laughs> casually down to the ring, and the heels are just continuing to beat on this fucking guy. I know that Darby and Sting have not been friends with Matt Hardy recently because Matt Hardy's been a heel, but if if you're going to do it, do it. If you're going to come help, come help. Don't fucking just, like, leave the guy twisting in the wind. Well, we'll get down there eventually. They'll just, they'll beat all of his fucking balls out and, you know, eviscerate his pancreas by the time we get there. <laughs> but it, as it turned out, once they got there, they were pretty immediately stopped anyway. The heels just stopped them too, Darby and Sting, and they start kicking the shit out of them. So then we hear the music, and apparently, and I did not know that this was the case, but apparently the Hardy Boys music in the WWE is generic music that they were they didn't write in-house and they were able to get the rights for it because it's licensable and they're playing the old Hardy's theme music from the WWE program. That was pretty cool. That was cool. Yeah. And there's the music. And of course, Jeff comes out. He has to dance a little before he goes and helps his brother. <laughs> yeah, but see, that's the thing. You're talking about Darby and Sting walking to the ring. Jeff's coming out to save his brother and these other guys, and he just starts dancing in the middle of the running. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't dance long. And then he got in the ring, and he made a comeback, and then, uh, you know, 
at, at the point where he makes the comeback and all the heels bump out except for the baker. And the baker is in there. He's going to feed all the baby faces. He takes a shot from Jeff, and he goes. He takes a shot from Matt. He takes a shot from Darby. He goes over to feed Sting. Sting's sitting in the corner with his back to the turnbuckles. And the baker goes over and fucking staggers over to feed Sting. And Sting just looks up at him like, oh, fuck you. He didn't even get up and hit him. <laughs> and, and then they set him up for a swanton by Jeff Hardy. So that's how they did it. The Hardy boys, Matt and Jeff Hardy, have now been reunited to face who? The Butcher and the Baker? Private Party? One of them's hurt, Mark Quinn, I think. Andre Ole, 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 and Jose? Fucking hell, they just... It's like they got 15 minutes notice. Hey, Jeff's going to be here. Okay, let's do something. They've had three months, right? And they wasted this now. Poorly thought out, poorly laid out, a rotten underneath heel group, a boring angle except for Jeff's debut, which they were going to pop on no matter what. They reunited the Hardy Boys to work with job guys. And as I said, they've had, because what was his no compete? 90 days? Uh, so they had three so. months. <clears throat> okay. Oh, God damn it. It's already snowing and I haven't fed the deer or pulled the truck in the garage. Okay, what do you need to do? Looks like the deer ain't going to get fed tonight. <laughs> I just looked out the window. Anyway, so the point is they they reunited the Hardy Boys in this fashion. To, the Hardys are not going to ever be over any more than they are right now. They're not going to start out now and work real hard and put their noses to the grindstone and get some good wins and climb the ladder and become stars. They already did that years ago. Now you're trading on nostalgia, fond memories, and borrowed time. And you don't need to start them at the bottom and work them up. You need to start them at the top because time and fucking indifference may work them down to the bottom. They've had three months to know that Jeff was leaving, and they've also had some time to know that he didn't fail that fucking drug test that the WWE ran him off about. And obviously, they're talking to his brother. He works there. You can't mean to tell me that when this thing looked like it was a thing that could happen, the Hardys getting back together, that they didn't immediately have Matt Hardy come out and tell the, his crew of job guys, you know what? <laughs> I don't know what I've been thinking. I've got a lot of shit going on. I, I, I've i reevaluated my priorities. Instead of trying to hornswoggle you guys out of money or whatever the fuck, I've got shit going on in my family now. And I, I need some time to think and reevaluate what I've been doing and maybe change some things. And you guys here, your contracts, tear them up. You're free to go. Fly away. I got bigger fish to fry. I've got troubles. I don't know whether I'm going to continue wrestling or not. And then you've got several weeks for Matt Hardy to make the veiled references about wanting to put family first, like they just did with the fake angle, and reevaluating his priorities, and how does he want to leave his legacy? And if he only had one more chance for him and somebody really close to him to leave a lasting legacy, a, a positive impression, no more screwy things that he's doing, Matt Hardy and AEW, and, and no more accusations that are being made about my unfounded accusations about my family members. We're going to set this right. And everybody, okay, Jeff's coming, Jeff's coming, right? The Hardy boys are going to reunite. And this, they're going to be the old Hardy Boys because Matt's got his head clear again. What about if last week, Matt, and forget about all this other fucking hoo-ha that they're doing with the Hardly Boys and their three-way tag team ladder matches and all that bullshit. Nobody cares anyway. What about if last week, Matt Hardy had come out and said, I want to talk to somebody because... I've been talking to Tony Khan for the past few weeks. 
And he doesn't want to bring my brother Jeff to AEW. And he wouldn't tell me why, and he wouldn't tell me why. And finally, I got him out last night after the matches or whatever, and I put a couple of drinks in him, and I got the truth. The truth is that Tony Khan will not sign my brother Jeff Hardy to come here to AEW on the advice of two of his executive vice presidents, the people that he relies on to give him proper advice. And those two guys are named Matt and Nick Jackson. And like, I'd like to have them walk their rabbit ass down to the ring right now and tell me to my face why they told Tony Khan not sign my brother Jeff. And here comes the Hardly boys skipping and bopping down to the ring. And they got those <laughs> smarmy looks on their fucking little faces. And this is where them being obnoxious children gets more heat. Because they can get those looks on their faces and they can go, well, you know, here's the thing, Matt. We advised our friend Tony not to sign your brother because your brother's unreliable and your brother's got a checkered past. And your brother is one of those weak-minded, weak-willed individuals that falls prey to addictions. Not like us, because our parents raised us right. We're good Christians. We have faith. We don't abuse substances. We don't go out and get pussy. Fuck, girl. They can't say that even though it's true. We don't have addictions. We don't have problems like that. We're fine Christian men, and we only want upstanding citizens here on the talent roster in AEW, and your brother's too much of a risk. He's a public relations nightmare. Yeah, well, just look. His previous employer ran him off because he wouldn't go to rehab. Yeah, motherfucker, his previous employer ran him off because he wouldn't go to rehab because he didn't need to and he didn't flunk the drug test. And I'll tell you exactly what you two are doing and everybody else can see it. You're hardy boy wannabes. You always have been. Since the first day you stepped foot off your trampoline and stepped in a wrestling ring, you've wanted to be me and Jeff. And now because you've got a guy who didn't have enough experience to know who to listen to, that, that for whatever reason you're in his ear, you don't want the competition. You don't want the real hardy boys, hardy boys around because you're nothing but the hardly boys. And boom, here's the super kicks. And they kick the shit out of Matt. In a serious, I know they can't care, but this is not gonna, ever going to happen anyway. And I know they can't carry off anything serious. The, you know, the Cucamonga kids. But if they kicked the shit out of Matt in a serious fashion and had some people come out and try to pull him off and get him stopped, and they'd be saying, yeah, we're going to tell Tony about you guys too. And Matt gets carried out on a fucking stretcher, busted open from asshole to appetite. And the following week on TV, the Hardly Boys, Matt and Nick, they come out and they have a match and they beat somebody, hopefully quickly, so we don't have to see too much of their wrestling. And then Matt Hardy comes out and says, hey, he's got a bandage on his head, maybe he's got a fucking arm in a sling or whatever. Think you did a good job last week. Well, I didn't need to talk to Tony Khan about this week. I just needed to talk to Delta Airlines about a flight from North Carolina. So, Matt and Nick, your worst nightmare is about to begin. And let Jeff Hardy, the daredevil that he is, fucking repel like Shawn Michaels at the WrestleMania in Anaheim from the back of the building into the ring and start kicking the shit out of the Hardly boys. And Matt Hardy throws his sling off and gets in the ring and fucking joins them. And they do a nice little fucking four-way, and uh, Matt and Nick get run off, and that's when Matt Hardy sits down in the ring with the microphone and his brother and says, now, Tony Khan, you may be listening to them because you don't know any better, but now you're going to listen to me. You're going to sign my brother Jeff, or me and Jeff aren't leaving this ring on your live television program. This is a sit-down strike. And do any of you fans want to see us leave before Jeff gets signed? 
And is anybody in the back going to be able to make us? And that's when Tony Khan comes out. Instead of wasting it on the Ring of Honor announcement that he dropped like a turd on a plate. He said, all right, if it means this much to you, and I don't agree with what they did to you last week, and I've got a problem with Matt and Nick myself because they've, they've gone too far. And you know what? All right, Jeff Hardy, on one condition, you'll be signed to AEW Wrestling, and that condition is the first Hardy Boys match is going to be against the Young Bucks. <sighs> or they could do what they just did. What do you think, Brian? No, I think Jeff Hardy dancing during a run-in to save his brother Matt from Andrade, his assistant, one half a private party, and the butcher and the baker was a much better idea. And obviously it took much more time to conceive and put together, and you're probably not really paying enough attention to the nuances. <laughs> it actually took me 10 minutes in the garage this morning to think of what I just said, but there's a... I'm opening this white claw for you, Tony Khan. Brilliant job on the Hardys. You are not drinking a white claw. Of course I'm not. But, you know, if you really think about it, they started teasing it. Remember, I don't even remember what the match was. Matt Hardy jumped the rail and started walking through the fans just like oh, Jeff yeah. did. <laughs> so that was really the beginning of the tease. And then, like you said, and I've killed Matt Hardy for his subpar work for a while, despite what he had to argue about and how stupid it all was. This was the best he's been on the mic. Yes. Since that promo after he got a concussion. The last time that he started acting like a real human being for one week. Yeah. Wardlow. Good old Wardlow. Tony Schiavone in the ring, the live in-ring interview with Wardlow, his big chance to lay this whole backstory out, get sympathy from the fans, tell his side of things, make him make himself bigger than he has been now that all the eyes and all the attention are on him. And now we know why he hasn't been doing any promos. And now we also know why they need developmental, because he should have been doing promos, not on national TV but in front of the people at the church gym for practice. And this guy, he's got all the tools in the world. He's got the size, he's got the look, he's got the youth. But he wrote down and rehearsed a speech and recited it with absolutely no emotion or conviction and an awkward delivery. He was trying to talk himself into some of this. I didn't believe it. He didn't believe it. The story of his poor, destitute mother is not the best material, but with some fire, some passion, some righteous indignation, and a little feeling here, you could have got it across. You're talking about MJF. They hate him anyway. One of the hottest heels. It's it's a age-old situation of the guy being kept under the fucking thumb of the the evil overseer, and he wants to revolt. He tried to fire up a little bit in the middle of it, but he's not comfortable, Wardlow, talking on television, and it showed here. And so he needs experience with his delivery, his inflection, and his sincerity. This, it, this didn't ruin his career, but this was in no way a breakout promo, and it didn't really stand up to the to the all of the buildup that we've got to this point to finally hear him saying i'm going to break free and max is a horrible guy and here's why we didn't you know we got some of those things said but there wasn't a lot of captivating emotion behind them you see what i'm saying i do i kind of was hoping he would sound like rex steiner actually yeah that way it, <laughs> you know that's what you're thinking you never hear the guy talk he says a lot without talking but he came out there and he just gave this whole story talking into the camera. He was out there for 30 seconds and just yelled into the microphone for the first time he's ever been on the mic that he's going to kill MJF. It would have gone a lot further, I think. I don't want to know every wrestler's backstory. Well, the backstory needs to be revealed, but it's not always the wrestler that needs to reveal the backstory. And the problem is, is that when you got especially a big guy and a guy that's inexperienced like this, people want him to sound 
authoritative and they want him to have bass in his voice and they don't they want him to sound like he looks and at the same time they want to hear a story that they believe that he really means and that was not here and it's part of it's the material and part of it's his lack of experience at ever doing this before but that you know like Goldberg didn't do long promos at his peak in WCW there's a way to, you know, obviously there's lots of ways to make a guy a big star without having him have to do this. <laughs> but I'm, I'm just, I'm amazed at the, the, the way that guys look so much better than the generation or two generations ago. They look better physically. They're better groomed. They're better looking. They can't fucking talk. The guys in the, I mean, you know, that's how, let's face it. A lot of the guys in the territory days they couldn't have got laid in a whorehouse with a fistful of 50s the way they looked, even though they were on TV, but they had the fucking line. They could talk to people in the building. They could cut promos. They could get laid. They could con people out of shit. They could fucking lay down a line of bullshit. And these guys, I guess it's, they all text on cell phones and play video games amongst themselves these days, and nobody goes out and practices those communication skills anymore but god this is a boring bunch of fucking people anyway uh qt marshall and keith lee were face to face we've been waiting for that forever holy mackerel <laughs> qt says he's got keith lee's back keith lee says i've got a very large back and i'm good and qt says you'll pay for that <laughs> hey what the fuck <laughs> That's actually the exchange. It's a 45 seconds of the back. QT wants to fucking buddy up to him. Says, I got your back. Keith Lee says, I've got a large back and I don't need you. I'm good. And Q you'll pay for this. Good Lord. All right. Moving quickly, Jungle Boy and Dino Douche wrestled the acclaimed. I actually like the acclaimed. I've seen enough of Jungle Boy and Dino Douche to last me for a lifetime. Thunder Rosa wrestled Layla Hirsch. I like Thunder Rosa, but it was getting late, and Layla Hirsch is built like Diamond Lil. Google her, kids. You will be astonished. And then Thunder Rosa won. So therefore, Tony Schiavone announced that next week, Thunder Rosa will get a women's title match against Dr. Britt Baker inside a steel cage. <laughs> And I thought Thunder Rosa was going to cry like she won Miss America. Yes, it looked, here she comes, Miss Cage Fighting Girl. There was Burt Parks over in the corner. A steel cage girls match on free television, just cause. Okay. Why don't we have the referees all get together and do a war games match? That'd be exciting. Oh, I'd, I'd actually love to see that. What a train wreck that would Kitty's be. Ten, ten referees, Book five that. on each side in a war games match. <laughs> Problem is, nobody can win. Who's going to call it? They ain't got no more referees. <laughs> good, All good right. Point. Snow, good snow point. still coming and the deer still hungry. I'm moving on. The main event of this fiasco was for the TV title Scorpio Sky versus Sammy Guevara. And, of course, Scorpio Sky had Lambert and the other page in his corner. And, again, has Scorpio Sky wrestled in the last six months to a year? We see him in the, in the balcony in the press box. We see him in Lambert's group. Has he actually wrestled in the last year? Well, they said he had some, like, incredible record in AEW. They said When's that. the last time you saw him on television wrestling a wrestling match? Well, him and... Ethan Page had that match at that pay-per-view against someone, and I don't even remember who, and then they've been around a lot. So I the tag team match against someone sometime at a pay-per-view qualified him for a TV title match on his own. Okay, I just want to make sure. <sighs> Again, here's two guys that are such great athletes and can't get out of their own way to save their lives. It's... It's not the the 90% of their athletic ability that comes below the neck. It's the 10% of the mental capacity that is above the neck that is lacking. And I don't know what they're thinking with this. They did a couple of nice spots. 
And then they went to the floor and Sammy went to run Sky into the barricade to his left. But Sky ran right out of Sammy's hands and straight head first into the rail on his right. And this can happen. You see it every once in a while. If a guy is coming up off the mat and he's bent over and he's looking down and he feels the guy grab him by the hair and start to take him somewhere. When that guy looks up and he sees that, and, and maybe Sammy said rail, right? So Scorpio Scout looks up and sees the rail that's in front of him, not the rail that's, that Sammy believes is in front of him. Sammy's looking at the one to the left. Sky's looking at the one to the right. And I swear to God, he and Sammy did the double take. Like he's running Sky toward the rail and suddenly Sky disappears out of his hand. Sammy looks around like, where the fuck did he go? Well, he shot off that different direction. So then Sammy, the baby face in this morality play, pulls a table out from under the ring and runs Scorpio Sky into the stairs now and then ruins any momentum of a match that they were having by taking forever to set up a table. They were on the floor for minutes without being counted out and doing nothing at the same time. And Sammy, I think, once did the stupid thing that JR felt it sounded like he wanted to call it and he'd, he'd, he'd call it what it was. He said, Oh, Sammy rolled in and broke the count, but two guys are fighting on the floor. One guy half ass rolls onto the apron and rolls back off. How does that break the count on both guys? You would never have a count out if it breaks the count when one guy gets back in the ring. Only a double count out would be possible. So, therefore, it's caca point is they're on the floor for minutes they're doing nothing at the same time then sammy put scorpio sky on the table and he laid there motionless for 21 seconds while sammy guevara shows the camera he's crazy with the old roughhouse fargo spinning his finger around next to his head climbs to the top rope shows the camera he's crazy again and then does a double forward flipping cannonball, two revolutions, off the top rope, to the table, to the floor. Sky moved, and Guevara crashes through the table, and it looked like it killed him. I think it broke his hip. It looked like it broke him. His hip, his neck, his back, his spirit. But think about this. We've now established that Sammy Guevara is a blithering idiot. He's the babyface, but he took so long to set this thing up, expected the guy to still be there, mugs twice for the camera, and then misses. The babyface I'm supposed to root for is a fucking moron. What now? He deserves whatever he gets. You fucking idiot. Why would you do that? It didn't make sense. And then here comes Ty Conti. And Ty Conti runs out and is checking on Sammy along with the doctor. Why? We find out in the next segment after the break, somebody said, well, that's his girlfriend. They haven't dated, kissed, or fucked on this television program before. Just the nerds on the internet know that they're an item. Yeah, the last time we saw Sammy on the show with a girlfriend was the girlfriend he, was he proposed to. He was proposing to his girlfriend. <laughs> and it wasn't her. <laughs> so they go to the break, and the announcer, I think it was excrement, pitches, this match will continue after the uh, match will continue. <laughs> the guy's fucking laying there. He just crashed through this goddamn table. His girlfriend is crying over him and the doctor's performing the last rites. This match will continue. <laughs> what are we going to see next? The cremation? <laughs> After the break, it continued. <laughs> he was back in the ring. Why wasn't he counted out? Why was there a special dispensation for Sammy Guevara not to be counted out when in he didn't get special treatment because he was cheated because the heel did something underhanded. He didn't 
like in the UFC, when there's an accidental ball kick, you get five minutes to get your balls back together. It wasn't that. He did it to himself. He wasn't sidelined by cheating. There was no recovery period called for in the rule book for a low blow. He just fucked up. So they just said, well, while we're in commercial, let's just give him a chance to get back in. Does that make sense, Brian? No, none of this no. makes sense. No AEW no. referee knows how to count. And it didn't, if he, he took that bump specifically because he figured, I'll take this bump and wow, people will go crazy. He didn't think it's going to make me look like an idiot. He didn't think it's going to make the match look bullshit. He didn't think it's going to make my opponent look like a moron because he's involved in this fiasco. He didn't think it's going to make the goddamn wrestling business look like a clusterfuck. Just, I'll get to do something cool. And he doesn't even need to get girls. He's already got Ty Conti. But after the break, he was on his feet and fighting back. And then Scorpio Sky took back over and gave him an over-the-knee backbreaker in the ring. He sold more than falling 20 feet through a table onto concrete. This is what I wrote verbatim. Everybody involved in this is a complete imbecile and should be shunned from society. So then the guy that should be in a body cast and a medically induced coma in an iron lung while his family prays over him got up and started doing running spots and springboards off the ropes. And I said, fuck it, I'm done. And I turned the goddamn thing off. No. Yes, I did. Do you know what happened? I do not. Don't care. Can I tell you? If you want to, won't change my mind. I, I'm not saying anything's going to change your mind. Fuck this match. Who Let me guess. Shit? He took another big bump and got up. Uh, well, no, eventually he got down. Scorpio Sky, your new TNT champion. And then there's a post-match where Paige Van Zant gets involved and starts beating up Ty Conti. So now you have Scorpio Sky, TNT champion. Paige Van Zant, they announced, is signed with AEW. Gotta wonder if the... I mean, they were doing something with her and Brandy. Is that the Ty Conti role now? Instead of Red Velvet, they're gonna go with Ty Conti? I guess time will tell. And also, here's the other question I have for you, knowing this now, that Scorpio Sky, a guy who they internally think really highly of. I don't think wrestling fans give a shit about Scorpio Sky, and now he's had two of their belts there. Yeah. Well, no, they would give a shit about He's a, he's a pretty good talent, uh, I said. Him and no Sammy charis- both. Nah, well, know. he doesn't have a lot of charisma, but you can get around that sometimes with an athlete that good like that. However, he and Sammy have both shown that they can't be trusted to go out and do anything on their own without fucking it up, because even if Sammy wanted to take that bump, Sky should have said, well, I got news for you. I ain't going to fucking cooperate with that. You fucking moron. You want to bury yourself? Get somebody else to help you. They went along with this shit. They came up probably with most of it amongst themselves. So that's my problem now with Scorpio Sky. He can't be trusted. And the people would care about him a little bit if, since he's been there since the start, if he had actually wrestled on television, especially since he turned heel and joined Lambert, more than maybe once or twice in the last six to nine months, they might care a little bit. Well, they don't right now. And that's my question for you. (laughs) One of two things is going to happen. Do they give him a little bit of a run here with this belt with Lambert? I have not been a fan of this. I think this has been minor league stuff, but do they really try to make it work here? Or do they have him just win the belt to set him up for Wardlow? Because Wardlow gets that title shot, right? you are correct son well there you go because they don't want Wardlow to have to beat Sammy Guevara because he's very popular that would diminish Wardlow's status now Wardlow can beat a heel although although, I don't know it it seems the kind of situation where MJF would cost Wardlow the match because of the title or MJF actually he's still under contract to MJF and kayfabe right well yes the 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 contract still stands he's just said that he recognizes now he shouldn't have been doing all this and max is an asshole and and you know but we don't know what max's response is going to be well you still got to do this or i'm going to sue you and throw granny out in the street can max demand the tnt championship 
Well, I guess he can demand it all he wants. Whether Wardlow's going to give it up or not's a different story. Hey, if he wants a job, if he wants to take care of mama, he better. Well, here's the thing. I got a feeling a guy that size and that he's won a wrestling championship, he could probably get booked elsewhere. Anyway, that was the big week in wrestling. Any closing, any closing mutterings or mumblings before I close this thing up and we come back on your show, the drive through next week? I wasn't crazy about this episode of Dynamite, and I guess it's notable, no CM Punk, no MJF. Well, and they did have a package with Punk and MJF, the, the dog collar match, and Punk had some fresh comment, fresh comments, as Bruce Pritchard used to call them, in the package, but he was not there live, nor, as you mentioned, we, we missed most of the people we'd like to see, and we saw most of the people we'd like to miss. That's what happened. And that's AEW Dynamite, ladies and gentlemen. There you go. And folks, it's snowing and the deer are going to get fed one way or the other. By God, if I have to hook Harley Quinn up to the dog sled and mush all the way down the, <laughs> the hill with the, with the deer food. But anyway, we will be back. Whatever day you're listening to this, just in another couple of days, check for the drive through. That's Brian last program, but I'm on it. So you can still listen and we'll uh, come back and talk about more shit then. Right, Brian? Right. There you go. In that case. <laughs> huh. Well, thank you. We're done. Thank you. Fuck you. Bye-bye, everybody.